hear me okay? Yes. Yep. Good. Okay. Thank you. So thanks everybody for joining again on our virtual um, Board of Finance meeting. Um, to echo what Tom said, this is a public meeting and we uh, do have the, the media on. Uh, we're also on channel 79, I believe. Like before, I would only ask for a couple things. Try to be patient before jumping in. I thought people raising their hand last time worked really well. And so we are gonna have to have a discussion around the mill rate. Uh, so welcome to discussion, of course. Uh, we just wanna make sure we do it in a way that's um, it's not talking over each other. And just like we did in the last meeting, which again, I thought was great. Uh, so with that um, bit of an introduction, uh, what I'd like to do is have uh, Judy, if you could do the roll call. And let's see if we need to see any alternatives. Thank you. All right, uh, Robert Spangler. Here. Neil Butnick. Here. Judy Neville, Tom Schulte. Here. Amy Carroll. Here. George Blavel. Here. Todd Lavieri. Here. Chris Labrie. Here. Okay, good. Uh, Michael Chen. Here. Oh, you are, okay. Uh, Maria Weingarten. And Here. Are you, she, uh, Robert Hamill. Here. No. Oh, you are, okay. Yep. And Kevin Moore is here joining us, all present. Excellent. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, I'd like a motion to approve the minutes of our April 7th regular meeting. So moved. That was Bob. Uh, motion, second? Second. Who was that, George? That was me, Neil. Oh, Neil. Neil, second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Say aye. Voice is fine. Unopposed? None. Okay, motion passes. Uh, what I'd like is um, if the first selectman could provide us with an update. Obviously, a lot's happened and a lot is going on in town. And um, and a shout out to uh, him and the team in terms of keeping the communication lines open and the information flowing. So over to you, um, Kevin. Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, so it seems like we're nonstop COVID uh, mainly, uh, and there's an amazing amount of issues that arise in this environment. Um, you get a daily report, actually it can now be Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from Mike Handler as to where we stand on uh, on positive cases in New Canaan and uh, we now have 28 deaths in another wave in care center death. Um, so, um, but I've, I've begun to work for the past two or going on three weeks. I asked Bill Walbert and Tucker Murphy to create an advisory committee to me and to uh, John Engel and Todd. Um, on uh, it actually it started as a uh, saving downtown, helping save downtown, but it's become a reopening New Canaan uh, committee, and um, it consists of uh, landlords and restaurateurs and a bunch of different uh, business folks from downtown. We, they meet Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at noon and give us advice as to uh, how we can help. You may have noticed we gave some tax, some rent relief to our seven uh, town-owned tenants, town-owned property tenants. Um, we've talked to landlords about helping to give uh, rent relief. The tax deferral obviously uh, is, uh, is very helpful that the town council passed. Um, we, we anticipate starting at least uh, uh, with, with free parking in the downtown lots to try to help downtown. Um, and uh, I don't know how long with that will go, but we'll start that into June. Um, and then we've been working with the plan uh, in particular for outdoor dining, um, which is gonna require us to invest a few dollars to reconstruct Elm Street and Forest Street, not reconstruct, but, but put some barriers up to uh, allow the restaurants uh, to take over the sidewalk parking, sidewalk, uh, dining. Um, so that plan is coming together. Tigers have been working on that with Tucker Murphy and others. Um, but this group has been very helpful. We've talked about ways that we can help uh, uh, small businesses and, and restaurants and uh, retail stores. Um, and uh, be happy to answer questions about that. Uh, this town hall staff continues to mostly work remotely. We have about seven people in town hall on any given day and that's uh, people are people are getting their jobs done from from home and uh it's not, not working too badly we are working on a plan to uh, return to the office a after may 20th and we're going to do it very slowly into june and um uh 
uh, continue to not have our visitors come into town hall to the extent we can avoid that. And we certainly won't have in-person meetings, but uh, consistent with what uh, businesses are doing uh, to have um, plans to have uh, the office spaces configured so that uh, people can socially distance and work safely with masks. We're also um, going to start Friday testing all of our first responders. Uh, we have an arrangement with Stanford Hospital to test all first responders and all town, town employees. Um, the purpose of that is to really give the employees comfort. Uh, I suspect we're going to find uh, very few positive cases um, and um, uh, some cases where people may have been sick and didn't realize it. But um, you know, I think our overall numbers indicate that the social distancing and the locking down in New Canaan was very successful in, in limiting the number of cases. Um, so then uh, budget, we, um, uh, things are, as Linda will talk about later, things are kind of slowing down just naturally. Um, people are not as efficient and we're sort of, uh, there are savings with closed buildings. Um, there's obviously our revenues in some, some cases like parking, parking meter fees and things are uh, cratering, <laughs> but we have, uh, we have um, some savings to against, to against those. Um, I think actually the uh, thing to keep in mind is that we have, um, uh, the Board of Education has quite a bit of savings, as Linda will explain. Uh, the, uh, the net savings though on our side uh, is uh, less because we do have reduced building fees, reduced uh, parking fees. Uh, and the Board of Education doesn't have revenues, generally, to speak of. So um, I'm working personally on various projects, as some of you are aware, on downtown businesses and um, possible sale of assets. And um, uh, we're working on, we've got approval from Eversource to install the gas line to the wastewater treatment plant for this combined heat and power. We're going to add there, uh, we got the bids back. Um, George and Neil have been, actually it came before the advisory committee yesterday on buildings and infrastructure. And we've got some very good bids and we uh, look forward to executing that project by the end of the summer when the gas line uh, goes there. And the schools are looking forward to <clears throat> doing the East school roof and the East school solar. And we are talking about doing several other solar projects, all with PPAs, no more, no more investment of capital. But uh, in addition to the school roofs at West and Sachs, if uh, we would look to be doing uh, more at, at the high school gymnasium to offset that Dunning Field uh, electric bill we have, and uh, also to uh, add solar to the wastewater treatment plant roof. So all that is in, is, is in motion. And finally, we're working on uh, the uh, MOU with the library and anticipate um, the discussion about the library won't occur until maybe July or August as far as a bond resolution, or at least at least how the, how the plan will go forward. So I think that covers a lot of what we're doing. Any questions? George, anybody have a question? Um, I appreciate everybody stay on mute if you're not speaking, but uh, make sure you come off mute if you do have a question. Uh, I have, oh, go ahead, Bob. Yep. Just, just curious, it, it, just because I deal with PPAs, you know, with work. <clears throat> so if we, as opposed to, I'm not sure everybody would appreciate what you just said in terms of if we extend solar to south and in, and possibly the high school gymnasium, as opposed to funding those panels, if you don't mind me we're kind of repeating it, 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 as opposed to funding those panels outright with capital expenditure so we own them, it, it, uh, what a power purchase agreement does is basically le it's a long-term lease. We, we agree to buy the power over a period of time. Do, do we have a sense of how long that would be? Uh, yeah, they're 20 year, yeah, Bob, they're 20 year deals, but obviously, so we did the South School roof last year after we, uh, South School Solar at four cents a kilowatt hour. For, and our, you know, the schools are generally paying about 16 cents per kilowatt hour. So the, and, the, and South School has been virtually 80% taken off the grid. And that, that, that uh, and, and it's net metered, so anything we don't use, we we sell back to Eversource at retail rates. So it's a pretty good, pretty good uh, economic package for us. Actually, I should say that actually the, the excess goes back to the investor as part of the pricing at the four cents. But um, 
uh, the, um, the the vendor, the you know, you essentially choose a financial partner as to who's going to own it and invest it and take the investment tax credit up front. We can buy these these pro projects out after after benchmark years, like 10, 10 years, where they've taken the economics out of it, and uh, so that we would own it in, after the twenty year period. And we may want to look at that down the road, but because of the size of the uh, of the installations at the schools, we never really contemplated investing our own capital. Now we're going to look at whether or not the CHP projects, the the, the wastewater treatment plant is going to be about a half million dollars, um, uh, but we have a one point million dollar sewer fund sewer capital reserve to pay for that, and it's about a five and a half year payback. And uh, but we may want to look at, for example, the SACS project, the CHP project could be rolled into a PPA rather than investing the capital. And uh, so we had we discussed that yesterday. That'll come into clearer focus as as uh, the engineer who's going to put, put that proposal together um, outlines it for you. We actually may bring that back to you as to a PPA versus a capital investment because right now it's budgeted for 775 in 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 the 21 budget, um, but including $100,000 of that for a new boiler, which is needed there. But doing the doing the CHP as part of the uh, solar project as a PPA is certainly something we can look at rather than invest in the capital. Got it. And, and, and I, and that's a good point in for everybody else, right? If you, if you, if we lease it effectively, if that's an easy it's way, to think about it. yeah, it's an easy way to think about a PPA. It's a lease versus payment. So if we, we had the 750 grand in the capital budget, we would not have to have that debt service. Instead, it would be a, a long-term PPA. Um, the value of doing that is that then you get a private owner actually owns, you're leasing the, the, the equipment, the private owner actually owns the roof and that, and that allows them to take the tax credits, uh, right. which is a, you know, allows a federal subsidy to be, to be uh, included in the, in, in the, in the capital uh, stack, if you will, as opposed to if we own it outright, we wouldn't, we can't take the credits. Owning it outright, you're getting all the benefits, and you're also owning it in perpetuities. And the, these things chug on even after they're used for life. Thank you. So, so yeah, I mean, Kevin, you mentioned, oh, go ahead. Was that Amy? Yeah, just so before the, you know, there's a decision, uh, uh, whichever way to go with that, we'll, we'll have the details before then. Like, this is the PPA option, this is we're buying it, this is why we're doing X. Which yes, is yeah, well, again, we, we, we authorized it for, for capital, but I, you know, we certainly, right. we should look at the, what, what the PPA would, would involve, because the high school follow on, which, um, uh, you know, my guess is the, the uh, Sachs project probably can be done for three quarters of a million dollars, but the high school will be a million too, and I think we really ought to look at, you know, whether PPA makes sense with that kind of capital investment. But you, you, as long as we're having a, a five or six year payback, you know, it's, it's worthwhile doing so. Great. You mentioned uh, just changing gears a little bit, the uh, the Save the Downtown Committee, but I wasn't clear in terms of how are they going to engage us? Did you say they were going to present to us or are you just, um, you're, they're working to you, they're reporting to you, they're coming up with ideas and they would work with us or town council as needed. Is that what I understood? Well, John, John, John Angle and Rich Townsend have been uh, listening into the call. So that when, you know, we're looking for what the town can do for local businesses, but also what we can, you know, we have a number of residents in town who, who are interested in helping. So one group of guys who meets every day at 530 on a, on a Zoom call, um, they've, uh, they've organized consultants in e-commerce and finance and other things to, uh, to, uh, to offer free, free consulting to downtown businesses. A lot of these businesses downtown, especially retail, were pretty uh, skittish before coming into the COVID crisis. Uh, so anything we can do to make sure they survive. We also are setting up a, 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 we have about 11 national brands in town that we're looking into how we can uh, perhaps like J. Crew file for bankruptcy. We'd like to try to not be on the list of a closed store with J. Crew. So yeah. if we can do those kind of things, we're looking to try to do anything we can help them survive and, right. and have, not have empty stores. Okay, got it. Anything else, Kevin? Anybody else have any other questions? Okay, we'll move on to the next item. Um, Steve Carl, Sven Englund, Russ Kimes, and uh, Phil Shibley are here to discuss the, um, the proposed ordinance to improve first responder recruitment and, and retention. 
Uh, who am I turning it over to? Who's up first, Steve or Bill? I'll, 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 yeah, I'll take it first, I guess. I'll take it first, Todd. Okay. Uh, one thing, Hi, uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me okay? One, one thing uh, we need to yes. do is let Mike Morrow into the meeting. Okay. Good. He's, he was waiting to get in. I think Mark Jimsky is trying to get in too. All right, so um, the, the town council, you got him in there? I don't Thanks, see son. anybody waiting. Uh, town council. There's no one in the waiting room. Oh, Mike just, Mike, Mike Morrow just sent me a note that he's waiting to get in, so. All right, so we'll, we'll keep going. The uh, town council is looking at a new ordinance uh, and we've, we've taken it to the point where whenever we have an ordinance up that affects a particular group, uh, we wanted to make sure that we run it by you. We asked to be on the agenda tonight. We thank you for having us. This uh, ordinance, this proposed ordinance is a tax abatement for, for volunteers. So it's a recruitment and uh, retention uh, move. And we've got a couple of guys tonight that can talk about the background but it, it, to tee it up, um, just to let you know, the recruitment and retention has dropped to a point where we're starting to worry about getting new blood into both the EMS and the fire department. And we're looking to try to incentivize some of, uh, some of the ability for them to recruit and retain their membership. So um, this, is a, this is sort of a town idea, an incentive idea to try to get more people to, to look at it as a possibility and to reward those and to thank those that are serving. So um, I've got Sven with me tonight. He's on the uh, ordinance committee. And uh, maybe Sven, you can give a little background as far as the, the, the fire uh, goes, and then we'll kick it over to Russ and Phil Shively, who's here from the EMS. You Thanks, there, Steve. Well, I guess it's no surprise. Um, New Canaan runs on uh, on volunteers for a lot of its stuff. And um, tonight we're talking about um, how to recruit and um, and retain members. Uh, the guys, without stealing too much of their thunder, you know, recruitment is you know is pretty obvious way to uh, increase your numbers. But the other way to do it is to uh, stop the bleed, and uh, and that has to that comes back to retention and. Retaining members is, is per, of particular importance because the longtime members become your leadership and you know, provide continuity um, on these volunteer organizations. And uh, you know all these people, or you know probably a lot of them, you know, the long timers. Um, you know, they're, they're your friends and neighbors for many, many years. So I won't steal too much, but I'll just sit there and say that retention for longtime New Canaanites um, in these organizations is particularly important. And I'm gonna go on mute and I'll let Russ and Phil kick in. Okay. Thanks for the introduction, Steve and Sven. Uh, Russ, uh, for those who don't know me, I'm uh, assistant chief uh, for the New Canaan Fire Company. Uh, I also occasionally pop in uh, and out of EMS. So I work with Phil in that capacity as well. Um, so the background to this is alluded to is that volunteer recruitment retention uh, has historically been uh, descending across both organizations, particularly hard hit has been fire. Um, the state of Connecticut 20 or 30 years ago uh, created uh, a statute that allowed for fire, police, and EMS volunteers to receive an abatement of their uh, property taxes. Um, we are really one of the very few municipalities that does not have this in place currently. Um, our neighbors in Darien, Wilton, Greenwich, Weston, Ridgefield all uh, have these programs in place, uh, as well as our northern neighbors in Vista and uh, Pound Ridge. Um, it's, uh, we were approached, we initially approached Sven and Steve to try to find ways that to not only recruit, but also as Sven alluded to, which is incredibly important, retain our senior members. And I think in the fire department, fire company, uh, that in particular has been a challenge because those become the chiefs and captains, and lieutenants who keep the organizations thriving uh, without that uh, seniority and um, tenure uh, and experience, they can't run for those positions and keep those organizations running. Um, so what we are proposing in summation is uh, the to take advantage of the tax uh, abatement that the state of Connecticut allows it I believe it's 1500 currently and it's about to become 2000 um, 
it is a drop in revenue. We do not see this as a cost to the town. Um, it's not like we're paying for things out of pocket. We also in the package are um, uh, looking to find ways to incentivize our non-resident members. And I'll let Phil talk a bit as well about uh, his side in a second here. We, the fire company, more than roughly half to more than half of our membership uh, are non-residents. They come from Stanford, Wilton, uh, surrounding towns. Uh, particularly, we have a number of our younger members come from those towns because they're looking to become professional firefighters and we're a wonderful conduit for them to, uh, to get the training and certifications and experiences step into that. So tax abatement wouldn't necessarily uh, incentivize them to stay uh, in the organization, whereas having access to things like the town pool, uh, the transfer station, um, tennis courts, things like that, which are in the ordinance, proposed ordinance, would have a tremendous uh, impact. I know the pool pass for the families was something that everybody was unanimously uh, very excited about, especially for folks who live uh, out of town. Being able to have access to our incredible facilities in New Canaan um, would certainly incentivize them to continue to serve our community and risk their lives uh, protecting our residents. I'll pause for a second, let Phil jump in. Um. Yeah, so uh, you know a, a lot of analogs uh, with EMS, but uh, just to give you a little bit of numerical sense, uh, you know back in the uh, the early two thousands, uh, EMS ran in the high fifties, fifty six to fifty eight members. Uh, currently, uh, we've got uh, forty four members, and with a couple of those being students, and then medical leaves of absence, uh, I'm currently running thirty two active riders. So, so we're short where we want to be. I mean, ideally, we should be around 50 uh, to be able to have folks uh, run, you know, just the required shifts, which are already pretty substantial, uh, without having to pick up extras and, uh, and to have backup crews available and that sort of thing. So, uh, you know, just along the lines we're describing here, uh, we've been looking for all kinds of avenues to try to do a little bit more effective job of recruiting and retain and retaining folks. We've been using social media. Some of you have hopefully seen some of that. Um, but uh, some of the things we're describing here, uh, we really do think uh, would make a difference. Uh, one of the items that uh, uh, Russ and Sven has mentioned is that the, the Connecticut state statute also uh, allows uh, first responder volunteers to have access to a town uh, health insurance plan of uh, full pay by the individual but at least gives them uh, access to a, a group plan that potentially they wouldn't be able to uh, do as a as an individual. Many of uh, the members I know in Russ's group and and a number of ours are uh, self-employed, et cetera. And uh, as we know, that's a tough thing in, in today's environment. So, so uh, you know, we're uh, we're excited that we think this will actually make a difference. As Russ said, we've you know sort of floated some of these trial balloons with our folks, and um, we've gotten very positive response. So. Uh, hopefully we can get support to and move this forward. I think it's worth so highlighting that it's a commitment the of the line. town. Sorry, go ahead, Sam. I was just going to say, sorry, Russ, I keep jumping on you. So, why don't, uh, Phil, why don't you uh, give them the numbers, you know, the number of people, yeah. the, the abatement, and let's talk about what the revenue is, the revenue impact is. Yeah, so, uh, so Russ and I went through and, and essentially counted um, on a conservative basis the number of folks who are currently residents of New Canaan, therefore would have uh, use of that tax abatement as well as non-residents. So, uh, you know, for fire, that's 16 on the resident side, 11 on non-resident. Uh, EMS, it's 28 resident, 11 non-resident. Um, again, using conservative numbers, if we assume that every one of those residents could make use of the $1,500 abatement, which is not necessarily the case, right? Because some of those residents uh, are, you know, uh, you know, high school kids in my case who uh, live with a family, uh, or they could be folks who are renting or what have you. Uh, but again, with the conservative assumption they'll use the $1,500, uh, that have a proje uh, projected impact of, uh, of a revenue reduction of $66,000 a year. Um, on the other benefit side, uh, you know, as Russ and I look at it, uh, we really don't see a lot of opportunity costs to the town for that. Um, uh, you know, the obviously non-residents uh, do not currently have access to buy a pool pass. Uh, so we, by uh, potentially providing one of those uh, free of charge, we are not viewing that as a cost to the town because they otherwise wouldn't be, wouldn't be paying that. So, uh, so that's how we calculated the numbers.
questions on that? I'm sorry, this is questions. Let me just lower those numbers. Yeah, I, I do. I do. I just uh, just for a clarification. Um, yeah, I just, I'm sorry as well. I, uh, based on your numbers, I thought we came up with a total poss uh, possible population of 66 people. And if I multiply 66 by 1500, I think I get 99. I get nine. I get. Uh, I don't get six. 60,000. Yeah, I think, 60, I think the total population. You're including the non-residents in your number, George. Right. Yeah, right. because I think uh, I think at least in the draft proposal that I read, the idea was you're going to cut, you're going to give them the W nine, you're going to cut them a check, uh, either cut a check to them or to whatever town there was they live. No, no the, we did decide uh, against uh, any kind of that would require negotiation with other municipalities who'd have to participate on it. So we were strictly saying for New okay. Canaan residents only, which. Uh, and this is assuming uh, the largest pool, okay, thank you. which Phil correctly said that they are not, uh, this, the large number, not all of these people would be eligible uh, based upon the criteria or would be able to take advantage of it because they just have uh, 16 fire, 20 ADMS as of when we did these numbers a few months ago, a month or two ago. Okay, because uh, in the draft that's uh, on our tablet. Yeah, I was gonna say, George, um, if I could jump in, um, uh, yeah, I think uh, the the uh, committee in drafting something up did put that in there as a potential uh, expansion from what we had originally t uh, talked about, um, which, uh, it, you know, if that uh, sort of works mechanically and is uh, supported, we'd obviously be uh, happy to provide that to our non-residents. And uh, uh, you're right, that would uh, add to the, uh, the projection in terms of numbers. I think Amy had a question. Go ahead, Amy. Um, yeah, uh, a couple questions. Um, with regard to what George just brought up, and you said many neighboring towns provide this abatement, do they provide the abatement for the non-residents by cutting them a check, as you were talking about? There are examples of that, so I wouldn't say that's broadly true, but uh, Russ, I don't know if you remember, but there were at least a, a small handful that do in fact do that, yes. It, it's a handful. I don't have the names off the top of my head, but it is a minority by far. Um, the, however, it, pretty much unanimously, you see they are providing it for their residents, uh, as well as the number of uh, mishmash, depending upon the, the municipality of access to other things, beach passes, gym memberships, um, Weston, for example, does allow the health insurance participation. Ridgefield actually has a pension plan funded by the town with a lump sum payout, uh, as well as fuel reimbursement for its volunteers. So um, just as some examples. Okay, all right, so that, that's the first question. The second question is kind of a bigger philosophical question. And I think, you know, Sven made the point that the town runs on volunteers. So we have volunteers all over the place. Everybody sitting here is a volunteer as well. And I just, and, and you know, I know people are gonna say it's health, safety and stuff, but I, I just want somebody to make the case for me that um, why do, um, just why this, this select group of volunteers uh, requires uh, additional incentives to uh, continue to be volunteers. And, you know, it's just, well you know, where, where, where do you stop in terms of, you know, you volunteer because you volunteer or you volunteer for some objective? Um, Mike Morrow, are you out there? Yeah. Mike, you Mike, you know? And I'm not, yeah, I'm not saying like that these guys are jobs, but I'm just trying to get I'm going to make somebody make the the, oh, the, yeah. the the case for me that it makes a lot yeah. of sense for this group. So, Sven, so, I, so go ahead and from my to respond. You still or what? Go. Uh, I, I I can jump in. So, Amy, my view would be that. Uh, uh, the, the heavy lift required for each of these particular types of volunteers is uh, is unique, right? So, uh, for example, with EMS, uh, folks have to decide to spend six months going through a, uh, a heavy, intense uh, certification process, right? So they got to school themselves a lot of things. Uh, they have to go through a state certification to get a license. Uh, they have to ride as a probationary member for anywhere from three to six months. Uh, 60 hours a month while they're doing that. 
Uh, and then obviously it's a commitment that in many cases has to be multiple years to, to make sense. Um, and then uh, I think Russ and I also believe that the risk level associated with these particular roles is different, frankly, than any of the uh, other obviously valuable volunteer kind of roles that people play in town. So it's a lot to ask of people and, uh, and that's why I think it's particularly tough uh, to get folks to uh, sign up to do that. Uh, as a volunteer. And to expand so on Phil, that, I'm telling how many hours it is to become. Good. Stan, go ahead. Is Stan uh, asking a question? So go ahead, Stan. So no, hours. This is going to to the. There's a, it's a really bad connection. Keep going, Russ. Then you were going to say something. Go ahead, sir. Okay. So, um, I think uh, I was to, just going to say that there's a very similar requirement on the fire side for certifications and training for the fire department. Basically, every Thursday evening for three to four hours, uh, our volunteers are training, uh, working. Um, Additionally, we have the same uh, or even more so requirements within certifications. I'll give you an example, a entry level volunteer firefighter is a 180-ish hour course to become just a baseline entry firefighter in addition to six months to a year of training that we do in house for them to become a, an active or interior firefighter where they can actually run into a burning building. Um, then beyond that, if they want to become uh, a apparatus operator and drive the trucks, that's another 60 to 100 hours. They want to become an officer. There's three more 80 to 100 hour courses that they do. In addition to the commitment that we require of calls that they respond to on a regular basis. So we do have thresholds of minimum calls that they're required to attend per year. In addition to the fact that they have to do the training. So it's a, a, the amount of uh, commitment hours is, is quite exceptional. Uh, and and, to, and I think it's an important point that, and, and I think Phil was a little softer and I, and I appreciate that, and especially given his role running uh, EMS, but it, as an example today, the, the risk ratio is higher. Um, fire and EMS, along with um, our, our, our brothers and sisters in PD, are putting their lives uh, at risk potentially in their jobs. And in the case of EMS, in particular with today's circumstances, they are uh, potentially also putting their families at risk uh, by bringing something home with them. Um, so I think that's a salient point. So the, the commitment level in both organizations, while fire does not require someone to sit at headquarters for hours, uh, hours at a time on a shift, uh, the amount of hours we require them in responding as well as in training is, is substantial. Uh, the okay, thanks. Hopefully that can And, and is the number, is the, the number of uh, yeah, I did. Is, so is the abatement number, I think when you're presenting it, it wasn't really in the document, so I'm glad someone brought it up because when I saw abatement, I'm thinking, oh my God, the whole amount, which it's not. Is it, are we talking, is the number, the level of abatement, is that still up for discussion? Is it 1,500? Is it 2,000? Is it, is that, is that a placeholder of 1,500? Because I think in the discussion it said 1,500 to 2,000, so. Connecticut general statutes yeah, allows a, currently uh, for fifteen hundred thousand uh, the next year. So it's 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 defined by the Connecticut state of Connecticut statutes uh, specifically, and the uh, ordinances proposed cites that and basically says the whatever the maximum permitted uh, per that statute. So it's fifteen hundred now, uh, it'd be two thousand, and it's off uh, property. Sorry, Phil. Everybody's talking at the same time. It's definitely and, and the requirements too. The requirements. Sorry, but well, let's say, and the requirements uh, about, you know, certification, how long you have to do it, et cetera, that's all laid out in the statute as well. So we wouldn't be making up our own criteria, we'd be following the state's criteria for who would uh, be eligible. Correct. The statute defines uh, a guide, rough guideline. However, the, what we've uh, proposed to um, Sven and, and uh, Steve as, and town council was that it, it will fall in line with the organ uh, requirements for being an active member. As you may or may not know, there are probationary members. These are people who are in the process of getting certified. They may have been in for a year, but they still haven't, you know, been blessed. An active member in both organizations, charters and or uh, constitutions and bylaws have very clear definitions of minimum participation, certification, training regimens before you become that status. Uh, and it's reviewed. And so the stat, uh, the, the ordinance 
states that uh, the officers in charge of those organizations will then furnish the list of those who are eligible for criteria. So actually, the numbers that we're giving you uh, based upon our estimates of headcount, the numbers that will be eligible will be less than that. Uh, as Phil had said, we went a little larger to make sure that we okay. weren't underrepresenting uh, the revenue drop. Thanks. Hey, Ju Judy's got a question, and then Bob Hamill has a question. So go ahead, Judy. This in 06, and it, it, You're on it mute, didn't Judy. pass. There um, yep. I don't recall. Am I, can you hear me? Am I on? Yes. Barely. You're yes. good. Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Let me turn it up a bit. Um, anyhow, when we proposed this, uh, I don't recall if there was a state ordinance uh, written with the requirements. We wrote our own uh, both requirements as a member and also time and job. Is that all included in the statute verbatim now or are you uh, writing that or revising that or changing it to fit whatever your proposal here is. In other words, they used to have to be in so many years and work so many hours a week. It wasn't uh, just a full-time member. I'm not sure how you're uh, clarifying full-time member. Is that 20 hours or less or more? Or? The Connecticut statutes, the Connecticut statutes define what constitutes an emergency of tech medical technician or firefighter. Again, uh, what we're proposing in the ordinance is that it is upon the definitions of active and in good standing of the organizations, the New Canaan Fire Company and the New Canaan EMS. So take, for example, New Canaan EMS has a requirement that members ride X number of hours per month. New Canaan Fire, we have a requirement that they have to make a minimum 5% of the calls and attend all company training. Um, so they're not insubstantial hurdles that these uh, folks would have to meet. And additionally, we would be... Uh, Bill and I uh, and our capacities would be required to provide those uh, lists of individuals as well as the criteria on an annual basis. So it would be reviewed regularly. But the uh, state statute does not define it because there's so many different things. You can't say X calls because in one town, you not get that many calls in the year. It wasn't about calls. It okay. was about um, over to you, Bob. Bob number think and number of hours. Um, okay. All right, uh, just a couple of a couple of quick questions, but also wanted to um, just say I listened to that 0684 radio podcast that Phil Shively did, and it was a, a great thing for everybody to listen to. If they didn't listen to it, it kind of walked through the requirements and that they're running short. Um, when I read the material that was sent out, I was a little confused because it almost appeared as though or any paid uh, employees eligible. It looked as though fire, if you were paid for and have been on the force for 20 years, that was eligibility. Maybe I misread that. I just wanted clarification. Uh, explicitly for the volunteers opposite. only. It, 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 okay. Then I very just clearly, obviously misread. It. Sure it's um, explicitly the opposite. Nope, you're good. Because we do have members of the for the career okay. staff who were volunteers and still are associate members, but they would not be eligible for this program and because of CBA reasons and everything else. Okay. Okay, that's great. And then is there any element of, yeah. of retroactivity here? I did see some dates in there that, and maybe that's, um, so would, would there be a, a you know, bigger number uh, due to a retroactive uh, reimbursement? Uh, we, yeah, we, we did not propose anything like that, Bob. Uh, so uh, no, this would be on a go forward basis okay. for the next text year. Oh, okay. Right. So those and who then, are the year, people, those who are active now and going forward, twenty, or they're active now and they've been in for thirty four years, then they'd be eligible. But we're not going to do a, a look back across the history because, frankly, it'd be very challenging for us to do that. And also, we may not have. I mean, the fire company's been in existence since eighteen eighty one. I don't even know if we could come up with the record keeping to identify the people who'd be eligible previously. So, okay. Um, and then, and then, lastly, the healthcare. Uh, buying in with the group is kind of intriguing, um, and maybe that's a whole other discussion, but would that effectively cost the town anything, and, and why isn't 
are, are we pushing ahead with that? Where does that initiative stand? That seems like a little bit of a win-win. We would grow our, uh, you know, our uh, number of people covered and you're paying full price and you get an option for better health plan than maybe you can get on your own. Yeah. Love some yeah, Bob, that was, that was our perspective is, uh, you know, 100% paid by the individual. And as you say, if anything, it grows the pool for negotiation of the, of the town's plan. So, uh, um, yeah, we didn't see any downside at all on either side for that one. Yeah, the and only, is that, that's, the only, that is one of the proposals. Yes. Yeah, on that point, though, oh, you know, we, we didn't run this by um, either Cheryl Jones or um, our insurance agent. That's right. Our insurance broker and I think we need to take a look at that because um, there may be a certain adverse selection that occurs and um, you may pay the premium of say for twenty two thousand dollars versus what you might be paying for a, a self-employed plan but as we've had experience with um, some other employee groups you you can really get whacked by experience um, with um, people who may have um, so I, I think we have to analyze that and give some further Feedback. Yeah, particularly this co this cohort certainly would potentially potentially do that, but it's also a young, healthy, uh, vibrant group too. So who knows? But, all right, yeah, I mean, thank you very much. From the standpoint of fire, we have uh, we have a requirement of our members that they have to do OSHA respirator physicals every year. So they're they're getting uh, EKG workups every year. So they're actually probably helping your pool in that regards. Well, and, they also but they also have family members. Again, fair. No, that's totally fair, and it's just as a from what we saw, uh, Weston provides access to it, uh, as well as Greenwich uh, allows participation. So those are our regional neighbors who have participation. Okay, we should we should uh, move this along. We, that one needs a little bit more analysis for sure, and uh, we should find out what their history has been. But maybe a question for you, Russ, or um, and for, for you, Kevin. But before I go there. First of all, just a huge thank you to you guys, uh, Phil in particular, and Russ, and all the volunteers uh, and first responders this past, you know, for certainly five or 10 years has been unbelievable, but the, <laughs> the past 10 weeks have been off the charts. So thank you so much um, for all that you've done in so many positive ways uh, from going around to birthday parties to uh, being out there at three o'clock in the morning and doing all the things that you do. So, so thank you. Um, a question yeah, for you, maybe you. you, Kevin, what's the process for this? Um, does, and has the town council approved this? Or maybe that's a question for you, Steve. Where are we in the process and, and where, where are we as it relates to our involvement? So we really wanted to get in front of you guys to get your feedback and make sure that, you know, you look at the numbers and the impact on the budget. That's really why we wanted to get you involved. I mean, technically this yeah. is in our court in terms of getting the language done, getting the approvals done. Mike Morrow's on the call. He's done a great job with the language, tightening everything up and looking at the state statute and trying to mirror what's going on in the state. We wanted your feedback and really to get you under the tent to let you know what we're doing and make sure that you were all up, up to speed and, and approve the concept in general. Then we'll, then we'll hash out the language. Obviously, Kevin and Cheryl, Cheryl's going to have to look at the, the uh, health side of this and figure that out. But we really wanted to make sure that you all were up to speed on the ordinance. So that's where that's why we wanted to get in front of you tonight. Okay. Well, we're not going to take a vote on it, of course, but I, I think I'll speak for the group to say um, things like tax abatement and access to facilities and those sorts of things. Everybody can get their head around. I do think there's an insurance open question here on insurance and and how that might work and some of those other details. But um, I don't know if anybody else had any other feedback or any questions. But I think at pass there's, uh, there's yeah, you know, I, some support to continue to assess and evaluate yeah george yeah. i think I, I just um i i i'm in favor of pursuing this um uh, even if even if the tax abatement goes to two thousand dollars um this is uh, a, a pretty for me this is a pretty easy uh, sell um these people especially the ems and fire guys um do an incredible job for our town and uh and a two thousand or fifteen hundred dollar um thank you does not seem to me to be unreasonable that's right, that's right. And worst yeah. case maybe it's going to cost us a hundred thousand dollars in terms of foregone tax yeah. revenue uh but on the other hand we could not replace the services that these volunteers give us for anywhere near a hundred thousand dollars 
That's right. Yeah, I need to recuse myself if we were to take a vote on it. Um, I have an in-home uh, EMS uh, employee. Um, but Judy, go ahead. Did you have a question? You're on mute. You're on mute, Judy. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I think at least the health side of this is long overdue. And it bothered me that it, it, it didn't you know, it didn't get a full review last time. But I do think, I hope that the issue of having physicals is in there. Uh, it, it, can I just ask that last question? Are we requiring physicals of both EMT? I know we do fire. Is that you, Russ, or Phil? Well, on, on the EMS side, uh, Judy, it's a required uh, on entry. Uh, we historically used to have a regular required physical. Uh, actually, somehow that got uh, dropped. And so I've uh, floated that as something that we want to uh, reinvigorate with EMS. So, so that's a, a TBD. Yeah. Yeah, that would be, that would be a smart move, I think, if they're going to say, yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, Judy. Any other talk. last questions? Amy, do you have one yeah. more? Yeah, I, I just uh, want to Amy reiterate. Yeah, I just think that getting a handle on the potential exposure on the healthcare is is very important. Um, supportive sure. of the abatement, but the, I think just reiterate, Todd, that I think it's very important. Yep. Thank you for that, Bob. Well, yeah, for the for the uh, residents, obviously, what everyone said is uh, it's an incredible uh, thing to ask of volunteers what they've gone through in the last. 10 weeks. So, um, you know, our hearts and thoughts are with them and thank them for that. The, qu the question would just be on the non-residents and if they created that sort of stipend. Uh, I think we should think through that a little bit more uh, since that seems to be not as prevalent. Um, we certainly need to make sure we can be competitive and, and grow the, the pool of volunteers and certainly retain those that are on staff. But I, I would just ask a little bit more thought as to maybe we could phase that in a year or so down the road just to see how this first first phase initially goes. So what's your timing, Steve? What's the, uh, I think you've got support in here and, and lots of questions still on some of the details, but generally support. What's your, what's the next step? So next step will be, we take the language and go back to subcommittee. We'll review the comments from tonight We'll get together with Kevin and Cheryl, you know, and we'll investigate the health side of it. We'll bring it back into subcommittee and try to get a final uh, draft going. And the way the cadence has always worked is we vote on it in subcommittee, then it moves up to the council for discussion. In this case, I'd like to keep you guys in the loop the whole way to make sure that you're on board with everything as well, because it's, it is a revenue, uh, it, you know, there is a cost to the town and I think you need to be in the loop. So. We'll keep you in the loop the whole way. We'll take your comments tonight and uh, we'll take it from there. Fantastic. But we'd like to get this go. We'd like to get it on the books pretty quickly. So we're going to keep it moving. Okay. Thank you. Great job. Fantastic. If there are any other questions, thank you all. Appreciate it, Phil. Thanks. Sven, Russ, thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Thanks, right, Russ. Steve. Yep, you got it. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Okay, Linda, over to you. We've got uh, a little bit of work here tonight. All right, thank you. Um, so, can you hear me? We can hear you. You're a little faint. Okay. Um, maybe get a little closer to your mic or? Sure. Let me do this. Can you hear me better? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, I have in front of you the typical financials that you get from me um, on page 19 of the handouts uh, that I sent you via email are the financials that you typically get for me at the end of every month, which compares uh, month to month, year to date actuals, um, and where things stand. Uh, I believe the last time we met, I had February financials, and I said I would strive to get you uh, the April financials at this meeting. So, so you have those in front of you. Uh, but what I also did for the purpose of this meeting, beginning on page 43, I also did um, a forecast, uh, started to do some projections for the, end, for the end of the year. And I also revised the year to date numbers. If you look at the document that begins on page 43, um, I have year to date as of May 8th, um, as of, I believe that Friday of last week is, is when I ran these numbers. Um, and so what I'd like to do is, is rather spend time on the other one 
spend some time on this document uh, because it has projections and then it has fund balance and so forth, which I think um, gives you context for the next discussion that follows. So if I could begin with page 43, I'll kind of walk down that page and then I'll go on page 44, which is the revenue side, and then I'll end there um, and then I'll entertain any questions uh, that you may have. Hey, Linda, just to make sure I'm looking at the right plus, is this on our tablets or do I have to go to my email for this one? It's it, fine. It's, 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 on the it's on the tablet as well. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Sure, Tom, go ahead. ahead. Yep. I'd like to know who that phone number is down there, 554 5804. Oh, oh, that's, that's me. Um, who is it? That's, that's me. me. As a backup, As a backup in case down. this goes down. Got a problem here? You got okay, Tom? I don't know who it is, but that's it's me. Uh, oh, it's you. It's, I have a second dial in in case this goes down for some reason. So I'm, okay. I'm dialed in to the phone as well as going to my computer, but it's okay. on mute. All right. Just being safe, just in case. Me too. Uh. <laughs> exactly, thank you. Okay, Linda, over to you. Okay, so it's page 43 of the handout and it's item, it's item 5B on the tablet if you're, if you're picking documents from the tablet. Yeah, but there's no there's no forty three on that. Five B only has two pages. Right. So five B is they're they're separated out. So if you just focus on five B, those are the only two. It's forty three and forty four that I'm looking at. Okay. Great. If you're looking at five B. Okay. So at the very top, if I'll start with um, on the expenditure side, the the column I highlighted in blue are the projections for the end of the year. The, you'll see two columns to the left of that is the FY1920 revised budget. And then you'll see uh, year to date FY19 uh, where we are today. And this is broken out in the way that we broke out the budget summaries that, that you were seeing. So I'll start from the top. Um, overall town operations, you'll see that we're budgeted, we're projected to come in just under a million dollars um, under budget for this year, which is somewhat historical to our historical um, spending trend. If you go down our pension contributions, they are what they are, that's the 100% of the amount. You'll see our health insurance contributions. Uh, year to date, we're at 4.7 million. Um, I mentioned before, we'll be coming to you to increase that to 5.7 million, an additional million dollar increase. Uh, this is as a result of um, not budgeting for the, for the library for two consecutive years. So we will be updating that. So I've included that 5.7 million in the projection. Um, and then the others are minimal um, variation from budget. But then you'll also see second from the bottom of that section are town COVID expenses. Um, Year to date, we're at $145,000 in various COVID expenses across the departments of the town. And I'm projecting that to be at about 250. Um, it could be a bit high. Um, it, it's an unknown number. So for now, we've rounded that to 250. And then you have the town insurance liability um, there. The next series of projections, you'll see that the Board of Ed budget, um, I want to touch. Yeah. Linda, just before you go to the next section, uh, did you have a question, Maria? I did. Um, th those COVID expenses, are those going to potentially be reimbursed to our town at 75%? Is that yes. the plan? Yes. That's we anticipate those to be re <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, we don't anticipate the reimbursement to happen this fiscal year. Hopefully, it'll happen next fiscal year, but we'll see that credit on the other end. Understood. Yeah. Do you have that credit coming through? Or no? No, because it's in FY21, and I don't have projections for that year. Yeah, okay. The projections okay. won't be in this fiscal year. 
Okay, we should got to keep that in mind though for the next conversation. Okay. Linda, does that include Board of Ed COVID expenses? No, these are just town, these are just town um, COVID expenses. So that we have nothing from the Board of Ed? Board of Ed COVID expenses are, I believe they're included within their current Board of Ed lines, but they're tracking those separately. Okay, okay you were about to talk about the Board of Ed. Sure. Um, and then on the Board of Ed, um, I've been in touch with uh, Dr. Lutze and Dr. Keating uh, right now uh, because of, of the closures. Uh, they're anticipating coming in under about 750. But in discussions I've had, and I forwarded you the emails, um, Todd and Kevin with the Board of Ed, um, and Brian is on the call. He may be able to speak more to this. But in preparation for next year and the students coming back, um, there are potentially additional expenses that will occur this year just to get ready in terms of getting the facilities ready in place to bring in students under, under the new normal. Uh, but right now we're looking at, um, at 750. And I believe the Board of Ed met last night um, and there is, uh, they created a subcommittee that's working um, on, on COVID related um, expenses um, and projections. But for now we're looking at possibly coming in 750, but we'll know, we'll have a better number obviously as the year progresses. Um, the transfer to the health insurance remains unchanged at that amount. Um, and then the series of numbers below are the pensions, 401A expenses, those remain fairly unchanged. Um, the next one that's of significance is the tax supported capital. You'll see that uh, you had a budget of 1.7 million We've expended the full amount because basically with those projects, we just transfer that money from the general fund into the tax supported fund, which is where those expenses occur. So that transfer has already happened and that's why the year to date equals the budget. Uh, however, um, the next item on the agenda, we do have a couple of cap tax funded projects that we're closing out. Uh, those projects have an unexpended amount of a little over 235,000. And therefore, um, one of the options that you have is because you have that money there, in this fiscal year, we could basically reverse some of those transfers that we have to fund this, these projects because there's unexpended money there. Um, and therefore, this includes a year end projection of backing out $235,000 because we have savings from unspent capital projects. And therefore, if we back that out, then we potentially come in $235,000 less than the, um, than the revised budget because of those savings from those projects. So we will be reallocating those savings um, to those projects. Um, town debt service is slightly low, um, a function of the recent refunding. Um, and then I believe when we went out, when we approved this budget last year, we didn't have those final um, uh, debt service numbers. Therefore, from a combination of those two things, you come in slightly below. Um, on the contingency, we had a budget of uh, 500,000, a little over 125 was spent for non-union increases, which was transferred out and into the individual department lines. But then you also have uh, one union uh, public work student that's being negotiated now. Um, and therefore anticipating that that union contract gets done before year end, we've projected that that amount uh, will be expended out of that account. If that, um, if that contract doesn't get done this year, we won't spend those funds this year, but next year when we begin the budget um, as part of the retro, they'll get spent next year. But for purposes of analysis, I included that number there. Um, and then the numbers below, the library contributions, the transfers and outside agencies, uh, those are to be spent um, as approved. And therefore you see that Overall, in terms of budget to actual, um, our budget, revised budget of 151.9, we will spend 149.7, which brings us about $2.2 million below, below budget. Um, and then I'm gonna flip to the next page, which is the revenue side of the equation. And so our tax collections, as has been uh, historical, uh, we have collected more than what we budgeted. You'll see that we're collecting, we project to collect $1.1 million um, in excess of budget. 
We've already collected 140 million. We've already exceeded the budget by already a million dollars. And just by the nature of, of billings, uh, we project an additional 100,000 will be collected between now and the end of June. Prior year taxes, again, we, we talked about this earlier. We budgeted 350. We had a one-time um, occurrence where we had a taxpayer that was delinquent and we followed up with that taxpayer um, and they paid. Um, that taxpayer was, I think was about 350,000. Um, and so they paid that and therefore our prior year tax collection are exceeding our budget. And therefore we've exceeded that already uh, year to date. Our investment income, um, as we've seen so far, uh, we've exceeded, we had a budget of 800,000. Right now we've um, received in a, a little over a million um, and therefore we anticipate our investment income to, uh, to exceed our budget. Our ECS, uh, educational cost sharing grant, uh, we anticipate getting the, the full amount from the state. When we did the budget, we budgeted for 75%. Um, and uh, we're, the, the, at, at least from what we've heard from the governor, uh, they anticipate honoring all of their commitments to the, to the town, and therefore we're anticipating getting that full amount, and therefore that will give us excess of what we've collected. Um, and then all other revenues are coming in fairly close, fairly close to budget. Below are some expenses, our revenues now that are coming under budget, that are kind of offsetting these increases that I just talked about, and these decreases are largely the result of actions we've taken related to COVID. So to begin with our building permits, we had already started to see a decline in our building permits revenue. We had a budget this year of a million. Uh, so far we've collected um, 735,000, but we're not anticipating to reach that million dollar goal. So we're gonna fall slightly short in our building permits. Um, our conveyance fees, uh, we had anticipated that they would be a lot less than what we're projecting now, but there seems to be a lot of exchange of activity of a properties in the past couple of months. And so right now we anticipate our conveyance fees to be just under a million dollars, even though we had a million two budgeted. Um, and then these are fees related to parking. Um, as you know, we're not enforcing any parking now. So most of the revenue from parking that we've received is close to what we'll, we'll end up receiving and I'll be revising those hit. numbers again. Yeah, that's a big hit. And, and the big driver there are, um, are our permits because the permits typically go out in May and the way that the revenue flows is we get a big chunk of permit revenue in May, June and July. Um, and that's about 650,000. So in July of this year, we got about 170,000 of that but typically in May and June, we get about 450 to 470,000. Since we're not billing for those permits, so we're not, we're not projecting that revenue um, for that 470. So that is a big hit on the revenue side. And so therefore, if you take the, um, the surpluses in those revenues, plus some of those deficits we're anticipating receiving, all in all, our revenues will still exceed our budget but not to the extent that we've seen in, in prior years. So we're anticipating increasing by about 400,000, uh, but largely because um, those enhanced over collections are having to make up for the under collection um, in those revenues. And therefore, if you combine the, um, the difference between the revenues and expenditures uh, for the year, right now you look at, um, we're looking at about drawing down the fund balance about $1.4 million this year. Uh, recall that when we approved the budget, the budget included a drawdown of, of $3 million and then with a million dollars additional for the health insurance, we were budgeting a $4 million drawdown, which we typically make up in reduced underspending and over collection. And so this year we're not making the swing to make up for that deficit, uh, but we're still looking at drawing down instead of 4 million, 1.4 million from the fund balance. And therefore that will leave us at the end of the year with a total fund balance of 31.9 million. The unassigned portion which you have available will be 29.1. You'll see that the assigned balance for other uses is going up 525,000. This again is related to the item you have on the upcoming agenda because we changed 
the 60-40 split uh, with the Board of Ed for that, for that corridor, mm -hmm. where we said we would take up 60% and they only take up 40. So that 60% is about 525,000, which we have to designate as a signed fund balance. And therefore, that assigned fund balance goes up uh, by about 525 as a result of that. The other components of the assigned fund balance is we assigned for um, heart and hypertension, which is just under a um, million dollars. Um, and then we have some other um, assignments of fund balance. But that's essentially what makes up the, the 2.8. The big chunks are the assignment for the Board of Health, Board of Ed Health Insurance, and then the town heart and, and hypertension. Um, so that's kind of where that leaves us with, uh, with the fund balance. And then to the far right, you have the approved budget that's in front of you, which currently we have $5 million plugged uh, for use of fund balance, which gives you a mill rate um, currently of 18.098. Um, and that's what I have as far as uh, year-to-date revenues um, and, and projections. And I'd be happy to answer any, any questions you may have as we go into the, the following items. Linda, quick, yeah, quick question. First, a statement and then a question. And then I think Amy's got her hand up as well. Um, yeah, so everybody does. So uh, first of all, great job. Thank you for that. And that's a fantastic update. Um, on the revenue, uh, two questions. One, is, are the conveyance, are you saying the building permits conveyance fees are your, these are the 99% numbers or is there any upside here or is there any risk to those revenue numbers? What's your sense? How, I mean, do you have a confidence? No, the, the building permit numbers are um, the numbers that I got from, from talking to Brian, just based on what he's seeing in terms of, of building activity. There's obviously been a slowdown. One, there was already a slowdown even before COVID. We had started seeing those back in January, February, when I was presenting these, and we had already anticipated not getting to that 900,000, you'll see that even last year, we were below, 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 that, below that target. Um, and this year, we further reduced the building permits revenue, even in fiscal year 21, we knocked that down to, to 830,000. So this was a trend that we were already seeing, but it's only been ex exacerbated uh, by the COVID. So right now we're es estimating 600,000, which may still be high because we're at 450 with only six weeks left in the year. Um, and, and I don't know, uh, Brian yeah. seems to be so that we may make the 150 K in six weeks, uh, but I don't know. We may have to do further revision on that revenue. And then the conveyance fees is just based on uh, property exchange is not necessarily connected with a tax collection rate. It's just a fee that we get 0 0.25, 0 0.025 uh, for every, for the value of property that's either sold or refinanced. Uh, and that's what drives that number. And we didn't talk about the parking permit I, you know, of, of not sending out the bill. First of all, no one can use the trains or they're not going to New York. So I, I totally get it. That's a very big, big savings to the, to the town, uh, to, the, to the commuters. How does it work? Is it, is it, is it the equivalent of three months or what, what, how does, what does you, roll, roll this out for me. What happens after this? What happens in the fall? Uh, Kevin, maybe, yeah, go ahead. I can split that. So since people haven't um, commuted for March, April, May, and probably June, we felt it, we ought to um, not renew the permits until we give people credit for those months. So when we do send the bills out, we will send our bill out for uh, an effective day of either October 1 or November 1, so they, they get that credit back. Most people renew their, their parking permits. And also the way we build this in the past, we, the revenues come in and straddle a fiscal year. So um, we don't have that straddle effect this year. Okay, okay Amy? Yeah, but, but next year, uh, yeah, assuming uh, we Kevin get through this, we'll have... Well, we're, we're gonna permanently give up, we're gonna permanently give up three or four months of revenue um, between this year and next year because we're not gonna charge for the months people weren't there parking. Mm -hmm. And that's both commuter lots and business permits. Okay. 
Okay, Amy? Uh, that, that's okay. Kevin answered my question on the, um, the permit, so I'll lower my hand. Okay, gotcha. Okay, other questions? I have a question, yeah, Todd. Maria? Well, I guess I was just going to ask oh, Kevin, so ahead, what Kevin is the breakout Maria. on that between parking? Okay. You broke up. Maria, you broke up. My question was just on the, my question, can you hear me now? Yep. Is on the parking, how much of that is uh, parking permits versus the fees and tickets? Well, it's, it's, you know, we're not charging parking meters either. Nobody's parking, so we're not getting any revenues from parking meters. So it's a combination of permits for the commuter lots, permits for the business lots, um, and okay. the, meter, the meter spaces. So it adds all adds up. My question to Linda, though, is why are we applying the $525,000 from the New Deal on the split with the Board of Ed on, on the insur insurance uh, reserve? to this fiscal year, why wouldn't it be applied to next fiscal year? Because we agreed to do that for the next fiscal year. Right, but the fund balance assignment at the end of the year assigns, sets money aside for the following fiscal year. So it would, it would assign for that, that's how we've always done it, um, dep depending on what the Board of Finance chooses to do with the use of fund balance for the next year, that will also be considered an assigned fund balance at the end of the year, which is what you begin the year with. So that assignment is this fiscal, as of June 30th. Why wouldn't we do it July 1st? It'll be the same number um, no. because we close the books on June 30th. And so you make the assignment at the end, at the end of the year when we close the books. That's how we report it. Not if we don't sign it until July 1st. <laughs> but you've already decided to do it. Yeah. That, unless uh, you... Linda. Yeah. Okay. I'm just curious. It's just, it's just showing our flexibility in cash. So it makes sense. Well, I don't, I don't know if it makes sense though. Okay. Um, if it's not an obligation until next, next fiscal year, it why are we be. encumbering finances this year? It couldn't be drawn upon until next year. Yeah, true. Yeah, and the other, Kevin is right. Uh, the other thing is, Linda, we took it out of the Board of Education budget next year. So in the budgeting process, Kevin's right, it's actually next year changing yeah, exactly. the budget. So if you take it out, you have it off balance with what is shown in the budget for next year versus this year, because it's reflected in a savings of 500000 next year. Right, but the entry, it, it, the, Pat, the audit know. entry, because you've taken the you've taken the action. Right. Well, why don't we why don't we defer to take this action in July? Why we, why do we have to do it now? <laughs> you can do, but no, no, we already took the action. It, it, well, I guess it would be whatever our approvals are today. Maybe that's the point. But it, you have to reflect right. from an accounting standpoint what actions right. have already been taken. That it's like a, you're creating the reserve because you've already taken the action. No, but the, the but the board of ed, it's next year's the reserve. Board, right, the board of ed assigns 20% of the reserve corridor. If we don't show it on our end, then the board, it has to be shown somewhere, then it'll have to show up on the board of ed side. Um, you can't take it out of the board of ed and not take it in on, on the town side. Because then you'd only be reserving. Yeah, you'll be reserving. You're right, Linda. Linda, you're right. But, but what we're saying is, in the board of education, we want that to reduce for next year, right? So if we show it as reflected in the reduction of the board of ed's cost next year. We need to show the changes next year. Otherwise, we got to adjust the board of ed budget next year to be five hundred thousand higher because we're showing their budget on their health expenses will be 500,000 lower in next year's budget. So you have a disconnect with where you're making the entry in the budget versus where you're making the entry in the balance sheet if you show it in the balance sheet this year. Then you gotta, you gotta change the budget uh, for this year instead of changing the budget for next year. So that's what we have both. in the budget. We, uh, it the, shows up in the, both. You know, and change right. the that's right. budget, not in this right. year's budget. 
Well, I make a suggestion I say, that the, auditor, right. auditors, the auditors are going to tell us to do exactly what Lynn is saying. The auditors are going to tell us exactly. to account for it this Sorry, way at, at the end of the yeah. year. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. There you go. That's right the here. point. It, no, no offense to everybody on this call. It doesn't really matter. The auditors are going to tell us what to do. And I'm pretty certain Linda's well, right. But then we got to change right. the budget. But yep. we got to change the budget for next year is what I'm saying. No, you don't. It's a restriction of the fund balance on a budget item. It is. It's just a restriction of your fund balance because you're going to get a reduction in the health expenses next year. They showed a reduction in the health expenses. It's restricted your funds. It's not a budget item. You can't talk over each other. But let's not talk over each other. Let's go with what we have here, guys. It's, it's not going to change the mill rate. Um, the new number is already true. in the 2021. This is a conversation around getting an update. We can get clarity on where that goes and when it goes, this year it goes. Other questions on these changes, the ads, the extreme new expenses, the fees. George, is that a question? Your hand's up. Wow, okay. Linda, great job, Ben. That's pretty clear. And and um, as you can see over here, we've got um, your analysis in terms of what the impact will be with the 5 million over here on the other side for the mill rate, as you, as you described it a minute ago. So unless there are any other questions on that, we can go on the financial budget, we'll do the tax funded capital, then have the mill rate conversation to keep this handy. Sure. So you have um, the list of the tax funded capital that, that we're closing on page 45. And if you're looking at the tablet, it's item, item six. Um, and these projects um, run ac across, um, across departments, including the Board of Ed. But essentially, at the end, once we close out these projects, uh, you have about $239,000 um, of appropriated funds that, that, that remained unspent, uh, largely because uh, projects came in, came in under budget um, and, and, and so forth. And so this ties into the discussion I had earlier when I was saying the financial is because you now have 239,000 of available funds in the tax supported capital fund, um, we did not need to transfer the 1.7 million that we did at the beginning of the year in addition to this 239. And so what I would be, what I would recommend doing is reversing the 239 back to the, gen 235, I rounded, 235 back to the general fund um, to take that credit in the general fund and then allow the use of these available funds to fund other projects, which is typically what we would do anyway. We typically would bring to you, close out this project and then transfer these funds to these other projects. And then when we come to you um, in June, I will have a listing of how that 235 was distributed amongst, amongst the projects. But this allows us to, to basically not spend 235,000 of the general fund this year and help the ending balance in this fiscal year. Um, the other way to do it is you leave this year as is, and then for the next fiscal year, not transfer the full, I think next year is 2.2 million, and you can take the credit next fiscal year. It, it's just cleaner. It's cleaner if we do it this year than if we do, we do it next year. Um, but I, I do need a-, a I'm fine proposal. with your proposal. Any discussion on that? Questions for Linda? Yeah, Bob, just, go ahead. Uh, but Bob, go ahead and join. I, I was just to say, it, this is what we have normally done in July. This is an exercise that we've historically done it the way that is maybe not as uh, clean as this. If we know, it's a good example of when you know something um, and you know you've cleaned out a fund, this allows us to clean out all of these funds, transfer the monies that aren't going to be needed, and then uh, freeze up a, a like amount of money that we otherwise don't have to expend. So, uh, you know, I don't, I'm very supportive. It's, it's good to get it done. Thanks, Bob. George? I just, uh, I just like, Linda, you're saying 235, but uh, the schedule I'm looking at is almost 24, 239, 886. Am I, am I confused? 
No, you're not. I, I, was, I was rounding um, because those credits will remain, will remain in that fund. Um, and then, because we'll have some more projects that will be getting closed out and then we could transfer. Um, but I could, but you're okay. right. I, I could not round and make it 239. It's just cleaner if you rounded it up. Uh, the credits just stay in that tax supported capital project fund. Any other questions on this? Otherwise, I was going to make a motion to approve. And Linda, I think we should just approve what you have in the file here of 239.886 if we want to keep it clean. Since that's the way the math unless you say that's not quite the right number. But if it is. No, that's the right number. OK. OK. All right. There, if there's no more discussion, a motion to approve the transfer of the 239,886. Um, out of the tax port of capital back to the general. Move. move. Second. Second. Amy, move. You know, good. All okay. in favor? Yeah. Aye. Opposed? Aye. None? Aye. Okay, thank you. Aye. Okay, great. Judy, I think Neil m made the motion and Amy seconded. It was the way I heard the hands kind of move there, so. We may have to go back and look at the videotape. Yeah. <laughs> Todd, Todd, okay. Did that Anything else, Linda, on that? Did that motion include closing the project? I, I didn't hear the, the correct wording. If I could have a motion to close the project as well. Um, yeah, I, I have to amend that. It did not, to be honest. It, it did not include closing the project. So, so what's the best way to handle that, Tom? Can we just amend that motion to include closing out the projects? Yep. Okay. So amendment to uh, to the amendment uh, to, to the motion to uh, include closing out those projects as listed here in the file. Um, all right. with, um, need a motion to move that. I uh, still move. Okay. Thank you, Neil. Amy, second still. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? None. Okay. Thank you all. Very good. Thanks, Linda. Okay, so mill rate. Um, Linda, you've got a file here. You did some analysis uh, also on everybody's tablet. Should we move over to that? Hey, Todd, before we get yep. to the mill rate, can I say something? Yeah. Pardon me? Can we look at the 2020 budget that Linda put together? Uh, the, pre, uh, the budget, the latest one that is up for our budget for next year? The one item I just want to make sure we're all in sync on this. If you look at the Board of Ed operating budget for health, Right now, the number is 9758415. You see that number, 9758415? Yeah. He's, he's referring to the 2021 budget, not the 20 budget. So it's, right. it's the second to last, last column on the right. Yep. Do you see that? Originally, the budget for that line that came in proposed was 10258, I think. We took it down by 500,000 because they were gonna transfer that amount from 60% COVID to 40% down uh, in next year. If we're making the transfer this year, as Bob and Linda recommends, we have to give the Board of Ed another 500,000 and bring that up to 10,258. But you can't transfer 500,000 twice. They took their budget down because they said they'll give us 500,000. They'll subsidize that out of their budget next year. So you have a mismatch on the budget. If we take it out this year, you have to give the board of ed another five hundred thousand in the health income um, service. I'll get money. it. it. It's fund Thank accounting. Bob. It's ahead, fund. Bob. It's fu it's how governments work. It's fund accounting, and in fund accounting, you restrict the general fund. In in for any actions, you could do it July one. You could do it June thirtieth. It's the equivalent. You're actually because it's a it's an insurance reserve. It's actually not an expenditure. It is a it's a it's a restriction of funds that are available for expenditure if needed. So it's not actually a budget line item. What we've agreed to do is restrict our general fund balance by that amount. And, and again, I don't really care whether it's June 30th or July 1. I will tell you the accountants will tell you that it's June 30th. And, and it, it's just how fund accounting works. So as listed here is accurate um, because those funds have now been reserved as, a, as an expansion of that quarter from 40% to 60% as the town share. Whereas, whereas Bob, if it was going into the Board of Ed's uh, reserve. Expenditure, that's why we're doing that, it. That would, that would be an expenditure 
into their reserve account. Right. That's exactly right. So yeah. In fact, that's why we're doing it. So for us, it's not a tax. We've already paid. You, the taxpayers have already paid for it, right? It's in the general fund. So it's, you know, whatever we paid it in the, over, over whatever period of time in the past, we're just restricting it. That meets our obligation from a budgetary standpoint. Right. But if it were the Board of Ed, to Kevin's point, we would actually have to put it in the mill rate for next year. Right. Okay. So as long as you're okay with the budget 9-7, I'm fine with that. Just long. Okay. That's how, yeah, that's just the mechanics. Yeah, Bob, Bob, Bob's right. I, thank you, Bob. Okay. Thank you. And we're selling state of Connecticut bonds next week, by the way, GEO's $850 million <laughs> issue for the state of Connecticut. Bob, I thought they were S STO bonds. Uh, they are STO bonds. Thank you very okay. much. What does that mean? Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, sales, it, okay. it's sales tax. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. Hey, Linda. It, before we before we move, oh, we're going to move to the mill rate. But I think as part of the mill rate, uh, you all set, Michael. With your question? No, that was good. Th okay. Thank you. On, yep. Oh, good. On the on the uh, as a part of the conversation on the mill rate, the town council has approved um, a, I believe, uh, in accordance with the governor's um, um, executive order, the opportunity to defer taxes for those people, property taxes, the property tax payment in July for those people who are eligible based on the criteria outlined by the state. Um, have you done, you've done a recent cash flow analysis for us um, to get us a sense of what uh, impacts that might be. I appreciate that we don't really know. We don't really know um, who might be eligible um, in terms of uh, deferring their, their payment in July to October. But uh, you've done some analysis and I think we ought to make sure everyone understands some of that thinking as we go through this conversation because it does impact potentially um, the, uh, the un unassigned general fund. But go ahead, Linda. Um, sure, let me, let me share something here. I think the visual will be helpful. All right, I'm gonna share my screen. We don't see it yet. Not yet. Uh, Here we go. There we go, okay. There we go. Um, so this is what what I did for, I think I did this for the board of, um, for the town council when they were, when they were looking at uh, doing the tax abatement. So essentially, uh, we're looking at a beginning balance of, at the time it was 29.5 uh, that we'll have at the beginning of the year. Um, based on what's happening with um, the way that the executive order was written, uh, escrow accounts are not um, included in, in the deferment, um, and we have about 32% of our accounts in escrow, uh, which is about $22.6 million. So we anticipate receiving that on the regular due date. Um, so I just put for, in August, we should have $22 million collected um, in sales tax. Um, and then 67% is non-escrowed. Of that, uh, we had uh, guessed I don't even want to call it a, pro a projection. We guess about 25% of our taxpayers will just either not go through the process of requesting a deferment or don't qualify on the 20% or the 30% lost income as a result of COVID. So if that holds true, we'll have about $11.7 million paid as scheduled um, in July. So we'll have that on August 3rd. And if the balance of our taxpayers take advantage of the abatement, we'll have $34 million or so that'll be paid on the new due date in October. Uh, we typically have about a 2% uh, late payment that pay past the due date, but do pay by the end of the year. Um, and therefore, 
by, the, by December 31, the assumption is all of our taxpayers, even the ones that are late, even the ones that took deferment, will have paid. And therefore, not including the fund balance at the beginning, just our total revenue collection will have 69.7 million based on the current grant list um, collected uh, by, by the end of the year. Our run rates, we spend about 11.4, $11.5 million a month. So you can see that just the revenue, the non-escrow revenue alone, the 22 million, assuming that that does indeed happen, that is about two months worth of ongoing expenses without, without touching the fund balance. If you flow in the additional 11 million from those that don't escrow, that brings your total collection to about $33 million in August with a spend of $11.5 million, $11 million a month. So according to this cash flow, we are covered for the first three months without dipping into the fund balance. Um, should we have to dip into the fund balance if these assumptions don't hold true, then we can. Um, and if the worst happens that we don't realize any of these, then at that point, uh, we'll have the option of looking at other financing sources, whether we do tax anticipation notes or anything like that, which, uh, which, which I, don't, um, I don't see us going down that route. Uh, but based on this analysis, because we know that the deferment deadline is July 1 for the applications to come in. So by July 1, we will know how many of our taxpayers have opted for the deferment, how many have not. And then by August, by the end of August, we will know how much we've actually collected from our escrow companies and how many of those that aren't defer, deferring will have given. And so I'd like to visit with you again in August just to see how these assumptions hold. Uh, but we do have plenty of lead time uh, for the Board of Finance to start looking at options in terms of what we need to do. Um, but the big number here is we spend about $11.5 million a month. Uh, we do have sufficient cash in reserve and in escrow uh, payments um, that we're covered at least for the first three months, worst case scenario. Um, Todd, I, I think this answers the question you had. Yeah. No, that's exactly right. I just want to make sure everybody understood maybe three important things. One, the $11.5 million of expense per month. So for July, August, and September, obviously you're looking at $34.5 million of expense. We have 29 in the bank. So if we collected nothing, we'd be short but not by a lot. We wouldn't want to tap that, don't expect. Point number one. Point number two is that we do expect 22 million uh, to come in in early August uh, from the escrow. Uh, as Linda said, that really covers July and August without touching the fund. And then I think the assumption of 25% choosing to pay, I guess that's the way I'd say that. I think that's what you really mean. 25% um, aren't eligible and choose to pay. I, I, I would think that would be quite conservative. Um, so I like that it's a conservative assumption. I would expect that number actually to be quite a bit higher, who knows. Um, but anyway, I just wanna make sure that, that, that the Board of Finance had that late, latest thinking. We've, you know, some people have kicked some numbers around and all the rest of it. I thought it was important to get uh, this laid out for everybody. Questions? This is a good analysis. Anybody else? I don't. So, so we're good. For, so we're good for three months uh, with the escrow payments and the conservative assumptions of up? those who will pay. Yeah. Okay. Could, yes. Could somebody just uh, remind me what are the parameters you need to meet to be able to uh, take advantage of uh, deferring the timing of your property tax? Linda or Kevin? Or, uh, yeah, sure. For, for residential homeowners, um, it's 20% um, income loss as a result of, of COVID. And then for um, commercial or, or landlord properties, it's 30% right. lost income. And, I, and I, think, I think the town council, when it approved, when it adopted uh, this approach, in order to uh, kind of cut down or eliminate some of the bureaucracy, they just said, the simple assertion by the property owner that uh, they've seen a 20% uh, decline would be sufficient for them to qualify for the three month deferral. But I agree with you, Todd. I, I think 25% is a very conservative number. Okay. Um, it's good to know. It's good to know we're safe at the conservative level, uh, George. I think that's good. I think Bob Hamill had his hand up. Bob? No, I, I was answered. Just the question was whether you had to, uh, you know, 
submit any proof to get the abatement, but it sounds as though it's just an honor system. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, thanks for that. Okay, Linda, do you want to walk us through the table you did on the mill rate? I, that was just good uh, context for this conversation. Um, sure. So that table is on page 47 of your handouts, and if you're on your tablet, it's item 7. Uh, do you want me to pull it up or can you follow? I, I have it. I don't know. Yeah. People have it. Um, and so basically what the table does is um, gives you a series of options. I did them in half million dollar increments. Um, and you've been presented with this in, in previous budget cycles when setting the mill rate and deciding on the fund balance. Uh, but basically at given the current grand list, which is 7.733 billion, after the Board of um, Appeal, Tax Appeals um, completed their work. Um, right now I have the highlighted at a $5 million fund balance drawdown, which gives you a mill rate of eight, a little over 18. Um, and therefore you have the options of moving that fund balance needle. Um, if you wanna keep those increments, I can pull up Excel if you wanna use other increments. Um, but that gives you a sense of what the mill rate would be, given how much of the fund balance um, you'll be applying to fund to fund the budget. I assume everybody has it in front of them. The, the highlighted yellow line is the current uh, plan and budget that was submitted in, to the town council. Town council what returned it to us. Mill rate of 18.098. Um, obviously, decline of 0.78%. That, that assumed a fund a, a drawdown of five million dollars um, from the fund balance. So that's the budget that we have in front of us. That's what we sent them. That's what it's exactly. So um, discretion. Yep, yeah, Michael's got his hand up. Go ahead, Michael. Well, I, as you know, the, the I spreadsheet I put together uh, yesterday or two days ago. Um, the biggest concern I have is we've been only contributing about three or four million from the fund balance. This year, at least in this plan, it says 5 million. And the concern I have, as, as I've shared with many of you, is 2022 is going to be a growth in expenses. Even if we control it well, we had a one-time adjustment from the Board of Education Health Fund of 2.6 million that we won't be able to do again next year. So our expenses grow by 2.6 million, about 32% on the Board of Ed Health, even if we, even if we keep that flat. We have a potential $1 million school start time that's going to increase. Then on top of that, if you just assume a 2.5% operating increase, which is tight for both the town and the Board of Ed side, the projected numbers I come up with is we're going to have a $7 million plus increase in expenses in 2022. If you start off with $5 million this year, in order to stay even, you got to take another $5 million out of the uh, unassigned fund next year. Plus, if you want to keep the mill rate flat in 2022, which I think is something we should consider given the environment, that means you have to take another $7 million out of the fund in 2022 on top of the $5 million. So you have to take $5 million out this year. You have to take $12 million out next year in order to keep the mill rate uh, flat year to year. If you do that, the projection has you in the fund balance, assuming we don't have any savings. If we have savings, great, but if we don't have any savings your fund balance is going to be down to like 11.7 million, which is well under the 10% reserve amount. So my thinking, my recommendation, my thoughts was that we should consider not increasing our fund balance contribution to 5 million. We should keep it around three or 4 million. I actually recommend 4 million. And the reason I recommend 4 million is because $4 million you can see from the table that Linda put together, you're still down year to year. You're relatively flat year to year. You go from 18.24 to 18.229. So you're still slightly down. But also, because you had a $4 million base, next year you only have to give $4 million out to keep it the same. And if you increase it by the 6 or $7 million next year, that's $11 million. So you actually have $2 million more to protect your fund base than if you go to $5 million this year. And given what's going on with COVID-19, given we don't know what that collection rate is, given all the things that could come out of the woodwork, you know, today we already approved probably another 60000 for this, for this idea for the emergency department. I, I think it's better to keep your powder dry, give the 4 million we've always given them in the past and protect ourselves and our fund balance in 2022. Because it looks like we can do a good thing this year and get five million this year, 
but then that's just is $2 million less that we have to protect ourselves in 2022 uh, in order to keep the mill rate flat. And I think the goal should be to find a way to keep the mill rate flat next year as well in 2022. Okay. Thanks, Michael. I, I, we have Chris and then Amy. So, um, Michael, I, I, I like this analysis. I took a real uh, look at it. Uh, so my question is, uh, first technical one, uh, wh why do we think that um, the, it's 3.5% uh, is the increase number? In, in the healthcare cost? Yeah. That's just an assumption. In, in the past, we've assumed that London, we've always assumed that healthcare costs will increase based on past history about 3.5%. But we don't know every year, but this year, especially what's going on this year, I don't think 3.5% is an unreasonable assumption. But you can make... The assumption is 5%. You can make it 1%. I think in the past, okay. we've assumed 3.5% for health care increases. Okay. So the, then the second question is, the uh, the expense line in the 21-22 budget of $12.8 million was calculated off the 1920 uh, year. Why wouldn't you calculate that off the 2021 year? Uh, yeah, because you go to the bottom of the spreadsheet, it's not really $9.7 million. It's only 9.7 million because we took a 2.6 million dollars out of the reserve fund to offset their cost. Their cost in 2021 really is probably around 12.4, 12.5 million. But because of the one-time cost adjustment we took out of their, their ISF, that's why it shows in 9.758. That's not their real cost for 2021. Their real cost for 2021 is about 12 and a half million. I, I thought that when they came to uh, talk to us and they brought their actuary along, they were talking about uh, a, a new run rate of somewhere around 10 or 10 and a half. Now, the new run rate they, they came up with, it was about 12.9 million. And, but they said that given whether they have so much in the ISF, they actually don't need us to transfer as much. So the, their run rate is between 12 and a half and 13 million is their run rate. But, they, but we made a one-time adjustment out of their ISF to take their balance down by 2.6 million. That's why you see the 9.7 million. That is 2.6 million lower than their run rate. And that's so why- that's, So that $3 million uh, delta is really what's uh, causing the hole in the whole system. Right. You got it. Yeah. So, it's not, so, it's so, not the only hole, but it's a big hole. Yeah, it's a huge hole uh, because if, uh, you know, we can't uh, have the, uh, we, we can't have the uh, general fund balance running around uh, at 10% or just bouncing around 10%. I mean, that is very dangerous. Right. So just to have it said, and then over to Amy, um, you know, the analysis that Michael did was, was, was excellent. I think it's also a, call, a nice call to action. Um, it assumes a lot of things that we don't have to agree to, by the way, and we have a year and frankly the year after to deal with, right? So um, I think it's important for us to look at all of those line items and think about the impact. The do nothing impact obviously has an increase in cost and expense that we don't want to have. As, as uh, the first question we opened his comments, there are also other activities that are happening around town um, in terms of asset sales and other things. All of those things can impact our budget. So we don't want to look through the lens of 2021 through only one model, assume all the worst the scenarios. And that's kind of we, can, we have this year and the following year to obviously make those changes uh, to adjust uh, those costs and expenses. Uh, over to you, Amy. Um, yeah, I would um, say like in, I, in general, I, I agree with Michael's analysis and, you know, I've kind of been putting the pom-poms up to see if we're going to pull down some of our cash balances, why don't we, instead of just applying it to the, uh, the mill rate, do it to buy down some of our capital needs. Um, but I would say, given the last eight weeks that we've all been in, um, there, there's nothing like giving ourselves some cash cushion. We are not exactly sure what happens next year. Whether if we t put one more million towards the mill rate or not, it's de minimis. It's 0.13 on the mill rate. It really doesn't make a, a startling impact to people's property tax. Uh, it would be on a million dollars that they could cost you 12 bucks a month one way or the other. It's just not a million dollars sets value home. So I, I think what we really saw, certainly with the market, just the complete seizing up of thing, the importance of cash going forward and having the cushion. So I, I really say, I, I, I would agree, I would say we should do it at you know, the 4 million uh, level. 
the fact that we have cushion makes a big difference. We see this actually at the state level. I mean, as late as the fall of 2019, there was proposals to pull down the state rainy day fund, which is at 2.5 billion. And there was proposals to take two thirds of it out to apply to different purposes. Thank God the state has at 2.5 billion. And you know, we are not in that position. 90% of our revenues come from property tax. We should be in pretty good shape. We have a lot more flexibility. But I would say on this, let's preserve our flexibility. We don't know what's gonna happen with the schools. We could have tons more kids in school since everybody's leasing up every property in this town. You know, I just think we should hold our powder on this one. Other questions? Thanks, Amy. Other comments? Uh, yeah, let me get in. Go ahead, Neil. Okay, you hear me? And then Maria. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, we got a pretty comfortable number here. We don't have a liquidity problem. Uh, every time we've done numbers like this, uh, that Michael did, you know, it, they always are dire because we can't plan on cost effectiveness. Making uh, four just seems, you know, I, I just don't think we need to have the rainy day fund, to be honest with you. We're a triple A credit. We, we don't have liquidity problems. You know, what are we saving this money for? And five, frankly, you know, some of us have talked about higher number than that. Uh, so I, I think five is the place to be. Four, just a little tight. Although I have to tell you, it does not make a major, major difference. Amy's right. But I'd like to open the dialogue for at least a greater than a $4 million draw, draw, drawdown uh, by others, if yeah, any. But you can't, you can't ignore Michael's uh, analysis. I mean, that 21-22 budget, if it comes down the pike like that, uh, there'll be some, a lot of explaining to do to the town. It, why, it won't come down the pike like that. It won't come down. Why, why do you think it won't? Because you would make adjustments in corresponding pla in other places. And also, there's always a surprise. You think all the surprises will be negative. <laughs> Maybe the health care education is a positive, you know. I mean, I just know that every time, the 10 years I've done this, every time we come out saying that the outlook is bad. Bob, you know that. I mean, you know, we always say that every year we're going to have a big hole to dig out of. And we usually can manage it. Yeah. yeah. Maria, Maria's up next, then Bob. Um, Michael, I just want you to talk about what your thoughts are on the grand list, yeah. because that obviously impacts where the mill f comes out to and, and what, you know, what that cost is spread over. Um, so, I mean, you know, we have, you know, the, the CARP project coming on, you know, we're seeing a lot of uh, activity, real estate activity that might be finally beneficial. I'm just wondering whether, you know, that's part of our consideration as well here because that would also help to offset any sort of increasing costs we may have to experience in the coming year. Yeah, no, that's a great question, Maria. What I assume is uh, working with London is just base assumption. The grand list increased by 0.36 this year. I assume the grand list will increase by 0.36% next year. Our supplemental tax collection, right, for the non-tax revenue, uh, we don't know if that's going to come in at 8.6 million. I assume it is, but it could come in at Five million next year, right? Depending on we don't have parking revenue or whatever revenue. So I didn't take a downside case. I just said going rate. It's been about eight six to eight point eight million. So I use the same percentage this year growth versus last year uh, for everything. But there could be downside cases. It could be upside cases. Also, we have don't forget the town council turned down the board's school start time a million. If we put it on the agenda for next year, that's another million dollars increase over this year. That, that we haven't accounted for. So on top of the 3 million, Chris, that we talked about that can't be changed on the health expenses, if there's a change in school start time, that's another million. So before we start any expense growth, we already have four, we're already $4 million in the hole next year. I, I just think that that's an unknowable at this point, given the fact that, you know, what, what these schools have to look at in terms of class size and- I agree. By the way, I, I agree with you, Maria. By the way, I think we, I agree with, with uh, Neil. We should give back the taxpayers the money and not have more than we have in reserve. I'm saying do it next year. We have all these unknowns going to COVID-19 this year. Let's keep our mill rate flat this year. And if everything goes great, we can give the back uh, additional supplemental funds out of, our, out of our unassigned fund next year. 
But in case there are things that go down, like our supplemental revenue isn't there, in case we have additional medical expenses, in case we need to subsidize other groups other than the fire department or, or the, or the uh, police department, in case there's other things, let's hold a rainy day fund, like Amy said, for the unknown. And if everything turns out great, then we'll give it back next year. I'm just asking. Okay, Michael, we got, we got people that want to speak here. We got that. Okay, over to you, Bob, and then to Tom Schulte. Unmute. Okay, so uh, in my mind, the reason to do four or five, if you want to have more liquidity based on on COVID and 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 some probability that receipts don't come in, that makes sense. The argument that that we should hold a million back so the mill rate is less next year than it is otherwise doesn't make no sense to me because all your it's it's not our money. It's excess fund balance well beyond what we need, and we should give it back to the taxpayers. Either you give it back to them now or you give it back to them a year from now. And time value of money is such that if we don't need it, we should give it back to them today. And then a little bit to Neil's point, we'll deal with a year from now or really 10 months from now, you know, what that budget looks like for the 2022 year. Having said all that, the real issue is do, should we have more liquidity? because we are not going to have a full year of tax of parking payments. We're just not, no matter how you slice it. I actually do think the counter argument to this is we're going to have a lot more, well, we're going to have a lot more kids in the school system. I, I, you know, maybe it's a hundred, 150. I, I bet we have up to 200 more kids in the school system next year than we think, uh, given what we're seeing in terms of people moving out of the city. So all of that would tell you to have a little bit more liquidity, but I, I fundamentally think it, we always have to remember that this fund balance of 29 million 150 is well beyond what we would otherwise need for a rating. You know, we need about 16 to 17 for a rating. So I'd argue we have sort of a $12 million cushion. We pick five of 12. If it's four or 12, the only reason to keep the extra million is for the unknown given, uh, you know, the, the coronavirus and everything they're going through, but it's not about the mill rate. You, you, to, to Neil's point is right on the mill rate. You just manage through that. Uh, and if people have an increase in mill rate, that's just, you know, that's a, that's just going to happen. But that money is the uh, taxpayer's money. And I would argue it should be given back. Are you at five, that. Bob? I'd be five. I would argue with five. I could live with four. Okay. Uh, only because of the virus. Okay. Tom, thanks, Bob. Well, look, Bob addressed a lot of what I was going to say. I would, you know, I mean, let's all be honest, reasonable people can disagree as to whether or not the right number is four or five. Um, you know, I think all other things being equal in a normal year, I sort of subscribe to the theory, let's move the money out uh, and get it back to the taxpayers. Um, I do think this one-time adjustment out of the ISF for the Board of Education is aberrant, right? It's, not, it's only going to happen once. And it is distorting if you feel there's value in kind of smoothing the mill rate and making sure there's not, you know, swings, if you will. Um, but at the end of the day, I think what really moves me mostly are the unknowables and the circumstances where we find ourselves. And I think just on balance, I, I sort of am leaning more towards what I'll call, you know, Michael's view, you know, supported by Amy and Chris and others. I, I, I think we ought to be more on the four side than the five. Bob or uh, George, any other thoughts? Thanks, Tom. I, uh, I'm, I'm kind of on the fence here. Um, I, I, I think Michael did a, a great analysis. Um, I'm not sure that those numbers are actually the numbers we're going to be faced with, uh, more, in, more in concert with Neil on that. I mean, those numbers are going to be what we decide those numbers are. Yeah. We were pretty clear with the Board of, uh, Board of Education when we put next year's budget together that they were going to have a heck of a problem because of moving that two plus million dollars um, out of their, uh, out of their, um, out of their uh, medical costs in order to come up with, to meet the one and a half percent target we had set. And we were pretty clear saying that uh, we were not gonna be too sympathetic for next year. However, that was long before we had COVID-19 and all the uncertainties that that brings not only into the town, but gosh knows what the school is going to look like next year. Um, if we have another 200 students and we're still practicing social distancing, that's going to create and trigger from some pretty significant 
uh, expenditure uh, expenditures for the Board of Ed. So with that, I would be probably closer to four million than five million. But um, I could I could easily okay. live with five million as well. Okay, Bob. Uh, you know I don't have a vote here, but the flip side of that is we may be in a virtual learning environment next year, in which case the costs will be considerably lower at the Board of Ed. I mean, it just you know you can spin this ton of ways. Um, I would be at five, but I don't I don't have a vote, so yeah. that's it. No, just wanted your input. Well, would everybody be, oh, hey, uh, Judy, go ahead, I'm sorry. Tom, are you asking a question or is your hand up from the last one? No, I'm trying. Sure. Okay, go ahead, go ahead, Judy. Okay, um, I've heard an awful lot of dire uh, uh, scenarios in the last 20 years and none of which have ever really come to pass. I think that we are in a lot of uncertainty, but I also believe that people are hurting now, and I think you give as much money back to the community as you can to the taxpayer. And I know it's de minimis. I, I understand what Amy is saying, but we can remedy that next year as well as now. And I do believe we'll probably, unfortunately, be stuck in another virtual uh, homeschooling thing. So I'm less inclined to worry about another 150 or 200 kids in the school. I hope that happens. I hope that they are in full session, but I think it's probably doubtful. Um, I, would, I would lean towards the whole 5 million. So, uh, you go ahead, Michael, yeah. Just one quick thing. I actually agree with almost everybody's comments. They're really well thought comments. I just wanna make sure that the key thing, and I agree with Bob, it's, it's, and all of you, it's really we want to give the money back to the taxpayer, right? But I think Tom Schulte made a good point. It's, a, and you do, Bob, one is it's more about the rainy day fund. So let's see what happens in a year. Let's see what happens in a year. But the second thing I think is important, I think taxpayers want predictability. They would rather have two years of flat versus one year down 10%, another year up 15%. So I think we're really, pretty much an agreement that we want to give the money back. The question is, do we hold it for a rain day fund since we don't know what's going to happen? Like you said, Judy, you don't know what's going to happen. Should we just wait and then see what happens? And then it'll be an easy decision next year to give it back when we don't use it. So just to review the bidding, and first of all, I don't think we can manage $150 million uh, budget flat solely based on our, our general fund. We've got work to do to do that in lots of other areas. So I know you're not saying that, uh, Michael, but just to have it out there. We've got, you know, we've, we've got to manage our, manage our budget. Would, uh, given that it's almost an even split, would everyone be equally happy and unhappy if we went with four and a half million, which is on one of the sheet? Solomon. That, that actually is what I thought we'd end up with, so. <laughs> very yep. elegant, very elegant. Adam. Very, very, very solemn, Solomon. Okay. Okay. Um, I think we need a motion on that. Great work, everybody. And as always, really good thinking and, and I appreciate all the input. It's always incredibly valuable and I appreciate the respect everybody has for everyone's thoughts. Um, we need a motion to move four and a half million. I'll move. Tom I'll moved. second. I'll George second. second. Okay, Tom move, George second. All in favor of four and a half million? Hi, right. Amy. Kind of a what? <laughs> I'll take it. Yes. I'll Your take hand it. is up. Your hand it is up. It doesn't okay. matter. It's it's so little. It doesn't. That's right. Matter. Okay. All any opposed? None. Okay. So moved. Thank you, everyone. As a I, as a I would of say that, one thing in giving back. I I don't want people to forget. One of the great ways we get back in the long term is to work down our debt position. And I know we're going to be tight on this tough on this this year going forward, but sure. you can give it back in a lot of ways. And you give it back once in a mill rate where you give it back and build it up over time to move the expense number down and give you flexibility with debt service. So I oh. think keep an eye on that going forward. Can I jump on that, Todd, uh, too? On that yes. debt? Sure. Maybe that's the way we make the adjustment towards the end of the year if we aren't using money, but we're not really doing anything to get our debt down specifically. It's just we're working its way down. It would be lovely to do uh, some kind of transaction in the interim to lower the debt load. Yep. Okay. We, we can use the rainy day fund to buy something. Let's, 
Linda, that's the way to do it, Amy. Uh, Linda, just to be clear, so if I were to net all that out, the amount, our budget, uh, the amount of money to be raised by taxation would be down year over year, right? The mill rate would be down year over year, correct? Both of those are true? The mill rate would be down. Let me look at the amount to be raised from taxation. I have it here, right? Is that the amount to be collected? Oh. Yeah, 140, Oh, yes, correct. Just right there. <clears throat> is it the 138, 369 if we use four and a half? Is that correct? Yes. And it, we did 139, so it's down eight, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars ish. Yeah, so it would be 130, it would be almost 139, right? Because we're going to put 500,000 back into the tax, back into, back into, uh, amount to be raised by taxation. And right now we're looking at 138,494. So we add another 500,000, it's 139 roughly. Yeah, we're $85,000 less than last year. Yeah. Okay, well flat or slightly down, good. Okay, all right, thanks everybody. Um, let's move on to the, um, to the super fee change. I throw to you. This is an update, by the way, in the review I believe we voted you for the agenda. Can I do that? So you, yeah, I'm here. I was uh, sorry. I was just waiting. Um, so this is a, a just. I'll give you a brief update on where we stand. You'll have a public hearing for next month to approve these uh, rates. In essence, uh, approve them last year in uh, for fiscal 2020 since the residential we we gave a three-year um, basically scale as to what would happen we are in year two so we're looking at quartile one for residential at 250 quartile two for 370 quartile three at 570 and quartile four for 835 three of the four are modest increases and one is a is in a decrease of a hundred dollars on quartile quartile four coming down we're trying to get us a little bit closer to a normal number uh, between between all four, trying to get us closer to a mean. Uh, on the commercial side, we looked at it a little bit differently. Um, and in this, there will be a, we, we looked at there would be a change each year. Um, it's a modest increase of uh, 2%. Uh, and what we also did was we broke out uh, super users, the high school, Sachs Middle School, the two Merritt Parkway service stations, and the YMCA being super users. So we took them out of the uh, quintile five category and made a sixth category out of them uh, and doubled their fee for an extra high user to $10,000 a piece. So category one, modest increase 2% to 765, category two to 1,275, category three, 2550, category four, 3570, and category five, 5100. The only thing that we didn't change uh, that we, would like to take a look at are the commercial condos, uh, the office condos, we should say. They were at $250 last year. Uh, we're proposing that uh, we make a modest increase there of 2% again, and they would go from 250 to 255. Um, I don't know if you have any other questions, but we, we plan to bring this to you uh, uh, listed in the paper for a public hearing and a, and a vote for next June, for, for the June meeting. Questions for Tiger. So Tiger, just to make sure I understand, um, in, 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 in classifying the schools as super users, um, you're gonna increase the charge to them to $10,000. And that's Correct. gonna go into their budget. Okay, and that's gonna go into their budget. Uh, but the $10,000 is gonna go into the sewer fund. Correct. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I understood. Should we be thinking of, given that the Y's closed, that, you know, you know, they have people, not, you know, choosing not to pay their fees and stuff. I don't know. Is, is, should we can make a consideration given the state of the world? I mean, the, well, the two Mary Parkway service stations are closed. I'm kind of less, less concerned on that one. But, I mean, the Y's closed. And, you know, they're, they're going to have a lot of financial strains. And I know it's not a huge part of the budget, but it's more. So, I mean, just kind of, just kind of like we're not, you know, 
we're not making people pay for parking because they can't use the parking. So just, I just want to throw that out given the situation we're in. This is, this is for next year. So would you're not anticipating that they're closed next year. You're just saying they're closed now, right? Yeah, I just don't know when they're open. I mean, you know, I, I haven't heard a peep about when pools are going to open, you know, so. And, you know, whether they get to open with locker rooms and stuff like that. So I just am throwing that out there. It's a good question, guys. It's, it's be, it'd be easy enough to ex exclude them this year, wouldn't it, Tiger? Uh, yes, or we could exclude them for six months like we had done the not-for-profits. Maybe maybe something go. like that, you know? That's a, that's a good one. Let's do that. That's we a great a suggestion. Of, we, we do have a little bit of leeway in the numbers as far as what we're, what we're bringing in versus what the budget is. So there's a slight amount of uh, play there. Yeah. So you, you wouldn't be hurting it. Yeah. I mean, you can see the, the service stations, they're, they're going to get up, you know, be running. But the, who knows when that's what's going to happen. That's a good suggestion. But Amy, what, what would we do with the schools? Would we do a similar thing for the schools? Well, the, you know, we're kind of paying for the schools. We pay for it one way or the other, right? You know, mm -hmm. so, as a town. So I don't know. I just think this is a, you know, freestanding entity with, you know, all the revenues gone or, or many, you know, I know many people are putting their, their memberships on hold and stuff like that. So they, I think they have a, a more difficult revenue uh, profile than the schools do because we still have 90% of our revenues coming in from taxes and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, wouldn't that be also applicable to some of the commercial uh, uh, properties as, and the uh, the churches as well? I mean, they're all in the same boat of reduced revenues. That's a good point. Yeah. Well, their fee wasn't doubling, I think was the thinking there, right? Yeah, they were just, they were just fighting. Well, but we're just talking about abatement for the next, uh, yeah. yeah, for right now, not for the next year, so. But, but theirs was only going up, what, 2% is, is um, minor. And the chances that these guys, you know, the churches and the office buildings open up um, to higher usage, I think is uh, more probable that happens first. And I, that's just, I just, I would, I would give the wide break. You know, the, the other parties, I don't, they don't jump out as me as, as quite as uh, uh, burdensome. Yeah, but the, the question then becomes is, is, uh, is a question of equity. I mean, if we give the why a break, we're going to have to extend a similar kind of consideration to all the other people who are in the same category as the why. Well, there's um, only five users, right? Five big users. I know, I know. Yeah. It's the schools. Yeah. Right. I'm not feeling for the, the mobile mart. I mean, if they're up and running in three weeks, um, we also, I'm not, I'm we also charge, we charge a lot less than other municipalities charge to, uh, to service stations along the merit and, uh, uh, and elsewhere. Yeah. So it's, it, we're, we're, we're markedly below our, our surrounding towns in that regard. Yeah. As I recall, I think the YMCA in Darien pays $38,000. Well, that would suggest that that's another issue we revisit at some point. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we got to talk about that next year. <laughs> but per, but perhaps, you know, to take Amy's point forward, maybe the thing to do is to delay the increase in respect of the why. I'm not, yeah, yeah I, I think you got to be careful trying to pick out, last year it was a class of nonprofits. I think it's difficult to try to give relief to one party. Yeah, I agree. That's fair. Yes, yeah, I mean, look, there's a knock on effect. My point is, is that if, 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 if what if the value of what we're giving is a delay or deferment of the increase, and if somebody wants like for like, we'll, we'll give them their, their we'll defer their 2%. Yeah, but if you pass a law for a single person, isn't that a bill of attainment? <laughs> I, th I think the town attorney may tell us this is not something we can do, but yeah, you'll. Yeah, yeah. No good deed goes unpunished, everyone. Let's just, do the, I think, the, stick with the program. The only question I have for you on the commercial is what's the total incremental cost or additional income for this increase? And, uh, for the increase itself? Just on the commercial side, the 750 goes to 765. That's $15 times, you know, what? Approximately $43,000. Okay. So there's a question you could ask. Would we be willing to defer all of them 
all all quintiles for the first Six 90 months. days. Mm -hmm. Just for July, August, and September. That that's a that could be a legitimate question. Mm -hmm. And and if the whole increase is forty three thousand, you're talking about um, whatever four thousand, three thousand something a month. Yeah. Right. Be, yeah, be approximately ten thousand dollars for the quarter, right? Yeah. Um, so we have, yeah, we have approximately twenty three, twenty seven thousand dollars in play, as far as, uh, but those that's what we usually use as a reserve for uncollectible. But we do have it, assuming we receive all the collectibles, we have about twenty seven thousand dollars in play. So if you took the ten thousand dollars out for the first quarter on the increase. Wouldn't necessarily uh, the red. What does anybody think of that? Just as another nice abatement, just defer it in the summer months. That would see. I mean, that seems a very fair thing to do because all all of these nonprofits have, you know, are all they all have payrolls that they're trying to deal with without receipts. I, I've kept quiet because I'm on the white board, but you know, I do think there's a, a fairness there. Uh, to just do it across the board of, uh, of for the increases for three months. It's not, and it uh, kind of matches up with the deferment on the property taxes. Yeah. yeah. Kevin, thoughts? You're talking about all the increases, just forgive a quarter. Just the commercial. I was just on the commercial side because oh, it yeah. picked up the nonprofits and the Y and that sort of thing. That, that was oh, the oh, oh, just yeah. the commercial. Yeah, people are still in their homes. Yeah. These well, were their homes more. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> if everyone is okay I think, with that. I think if you do it by classes, you're okay. Okay, so if everyone's okay with that, on the commercial side, Tiger, could you rerun it and maybe that's what we post instead? We would defer it 90 days on the commercial. That's fine. We can do that. Okay. okay, maybe that's a good compromise, guys. Hey, Todd, just point of clarification on. Um, what the board, what the town council did with the um, with the ninety day extension, that also applies to sewer. It's not just property taxes. But it's just deferral. But it's just deferral. Yes. It's not. It's not rebate. Right. This is different. We're not increasing for ninety days, so that's a real savings. Okay, Kevin, are you keeping track of all these savings that um, the town's working to uh, provide? It's uh, it's starting to stack up between parking permits and. Other things, it's an amazing how unbelievable everyone's been. So, well, park, parking is a big deal. That's a big hit to our revenues. Yeah, I know, but it's the right thing to do to our, for our town, for our residents. I, I, um, no, I agree. I agree. Okay. Okay. Look, if everyone's okay, but thank you, Tiger. Anything else that we need to know for now? We'll, we'll, we'll get this noticed and you'll, you'll get, we'll get it noticed and it'll be, uh, be ready for next month. No, very thank good. you. Thank you very, very much. Okay. All right, Linda, over to you, number nine, internal service agreement. All right, um, I'm going to take you back one. Um, as we were talking, Tom and I looked at the minutes from last year. There were actually two votes. There was a vote on the fund balance and also a vote on the mill rate. Um, and so you voted on the fund balance of four and a half million, uh, but we also you. need to vote on the 18.164 mill rate. Okay, so I need a motion to approve the mill rate of 18.164. So moved. Bob moved, second. George, thank you. All in favor of the mill rate? Aye. Aye. Opposed? None? Very good, so moved. Thanks, Linda. Thank Thanks, you. Tom. Uh, the eternal service agreement is on page 50. Uh, we brought this to you last month just as a review. But essentially, it's the same as the one that we have in um, that we have that's in existence, and we basically flip the 60/40 uh, share um, of the corridor. And so we, we just need to approve that um, in order for it to be an assignment of the fund balance. Um, you do need to take this action so that the auditors will know to segregate those funds and make them unavailable for any other use. Tom, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, I just had a quick question, which was, uh, Linda, just if you could remind us that this draft has been reviewed and there's no outstanding issues or comments from BOE, they're okay with this? Uh, yes, and Joanne is on, is on the line, but it is the same agreement that we have and we just changed the 60 and the 40, but 
Joanne, feel yep. free to jump in. Yeah, we're fine with it. Perfect. Thank you, Joanne. Thanks, Joanne. Other questions? Any other questions for Linda? For Dr. Does this, does this okay. mean that if we didn't uh, pass this yet, we haven't actually made the reserve? Uh, you know, it goes, goes back to the debate we were having earlier about the five hundred thousand dollars. Well, if you don't pass this, then the one that you have in existence is the forty sixty split. So you still have you still have an agreement in place, but it wouldn't. Basically, we would be underfunding the reserve because the Board of Ed is contributing less and we wouldn't be assigning the difference. So we would be under-reserving if we didn't approve the new split. But I think Bob's point, Bob Spangler's point was that if you did, even if you did in July, the auditors would look at it as having been done for June 30th. Yeah, except if you don't vote on this yet, you haven't done it. There's no reason to be cute. I don't think there's any reason to be cute. No, no money is really saved, right? Right. Okay. Anything else? Okay. That's, uh, that requires a motion. Motion to go ahead, Judy, on if you want to read it, but re review and approve the. On mute. Todd, are you still looking for a motion? Yep. I move. Yep. George, move. Second, please. Yeah, Michael Chen, thank you. All in favor of the uh, internal service agreement? Aye. 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 Opposed? None? Thank you. All right, great. All right. Um, Linda, you can give us an update on the East School roof, and then Judy, I'll need you to read the resolution for the, uh, for the bond authorization. And I think everyone remembers this was, while we're holding capital, watching capital, looking at everything, this is sort of special, as is the next one on the uh, bridge, regards to safety and health. And uh, it was important uh, for timing reasons, of course, for the school um, to get this project started and funded. So I think there was wide support for that. So uh, Linda, update, anything new news on this? Um, no news on, on any of these. We've, we, we spoke about the e-school roof uh, before and we've spoken about the bridge project. The only thing I would bring to your attention is um, because of the executive order uh, that was passed, which limits uh, referendum on project um, section 10 is a new section that's added to both of these resolutions. Uh, which basically um, says that these are um, emergency uh, projects. Uh, so Section 10 is something new that was advised to us by Bond Council that we haven't seen before, but it basically says that um, in accordance with the Executive Order 7S issued by the governor, um, that these projects need to move forward um, because um, they are directly related to the safety of the community. And I think a roof and a bridge both meet that criteria. Okay. You reminded Messenger of Any questions? I hear someone talking. Did someone have a question? On the bonding? Okay. All right. Judy, you want to read the resolution? We'll take a vote. Recommend it to send to the town council. You're on mute, Judy. <laughs> okay, e-school roof bond resolution. Uh, resolution authorizing an appropriation of two million two for the e-school roof 220 project and the financing of said appropriation by the issuance of general obligation bonds of the town and notes in anticipation of such bonds in an amount not to exceed two million two. Do you want me to read resolved or not? No, no, no. no. <laughs> all right. I thought okay, that was all. We don't need to do that. Um, no, no. Okay. Right. Uh, motion to approve to and to recommend to the town council. So moved. Bob. Second. Michael Chen. Yeah, Michael Chen. Second. Thank you. All in favor. Aye. Opposed. None. So moved. Hey, Tiger. Can you remind me? Wasn't the original price higher? They came in lower, right? Than we initially put in for, right? This is this will be out to bid uh, oh, okay. Thursday. Okay. 
Okay. And second uh, bond resolution, Linda, on the West Road Bridge. Yes, and Tiger's on the call. Tiger, if you wish to speak to this project. Uh, certainly, West Road Bridge, uh, we had a drainage issue or a large storm that uh, caused one whole side of the bridge, one whole head wall to, uh, to collapse. Uh, we did some emergency repairs with an engineering firm in our highway department that did an excellent job. We went to the state for some funding. They were able to provide 50-50 funding, 50 from the town, 50 from the state. We, uh, we had it designed on a fast track and we're, as I mentioned, we're gonna go out to bid. Uh, it's out, it'll be out in the paper on Thursday. We're hoping to have it constructed this season. We're waiting for one final permit from the, from the DEP and we're hoping for that approval at the end of the week. And Tiger, is the two million the town's share, or is there going to be some two uh, recap? Two million is total, and mm -hmm. it's one million, one million. The thought was that we have to we have to resolve the entire allotment. Plus, the the thought was that I have to do the bridge. If the state for some reason reneges on their million dollars because they don't have any money left, we still need to do the bridge, right? So, okay. the council thought it'd be best to have the, the entire allotment in there for those two reasons. The good news is we can go back to the governor and say, according to section 10, we had to do this this way. We'll see if that holds. All right. Any other question, discussion on the bridge? We have some. Yeah. Yep. Go ahead and read the resolution. West Road Bridge Bond Resolution. Resolution authorizing an appropriation of $2 million for the West Road Bridge 220 project and the financing of said appropriation by the issuance of general obligation bonds of the town and note in anticipation of such bonds in amount not to exceed $2 million. Okay, a motion to approve. So moved. Tom? Second. Second, Second Neil, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, none. Okay, so moved. Thanks everyone. All right, last item uh, is review of the line item transfers, Linda. Anything to point out there? No, you have those on page 56 of your handout, um, and these are just the usual movement of money between line items, just to stay within, within budget. Uh, yep. But um, these are just informational. Okay. Okay, I don't think there's anything other. Tom, anything else that we needed to cover tonight? Nope. Okay, thank you everyone. Motion to adjourn. Judy, second. Amy, okay. All in favor? Aye. No one's opposed? Call it a night. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Thank Thanks you. to the city of the town for knocking themselves out working through all this. Thanks That's so much. Thank uh, you. Everybody's right there. Everybody, and, Lunda. and Lunda, you don't have to wear a tie in June. Brian, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, great yeah. call out. Good. Tiger, thank you. Um, Brian, Brian, definitely. My goodness. Thanks, Kevin. Everybody. Okay, good night, all. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Thanks, all. Thanks, thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye.